Welcome to the KFI News Special, Sex, Drugs, and Social Media. I'm Steve Gregory, along with Roxy Carpatian with Fox 11. Joining us now is our first guest. It is the special agent in charge of the Homeland Security Investigations Division of Los Angeles, Agent Eddie Wong. Agent, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about HSI. What does it do and how does it really help protect America? Excellent question, Steve. So Homeland Security Investigations is the pri uh, principal investigative arm for the Department of Homeland Security. So. Uh, we enforce over 400 federal statutes, uh, and my area of jurisdiction runs all the way north uh, from Santa, uh, San Luis Obispo County uh, to all the way to the southernmost tip of Orange County, and then all the way east out the state line uh, to encompass uh, Riverside and San Bernardino County. So we have uh, approximately 400 personnel uh, to investigate and police uh, the nation's second largest uh, metropolitan area when it comes to uh, the illicit uh, movement of people, goods, uh, and finance. How long have you been uh, with this department? Uh, I, I've, begin, uh, I, I've been with the department since its inception in March of two, uh, 2003. Uh, so we're uh, in our 21st year of existence uh, and uh, came in, into existence uh, after the tragedies of 9-11 uh, uh, where they uh, the agency was formed from the, uh, the investigative branches from the former Immigration and Naturalization Service and the former U.S. Customs Service. How does, it, how does HSI differ from FBI and CIA? So uh, again, so uh, the CIA is an intelligence-based organization. FBI is uh, out of uh, the Department of Justice. As I said previously, uh, HSI is the principal uh, investigative arm of the Department of Homeland Security. A lot of what we do deals with uh, 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 security of the border, uh, meaning illicit goods, narcotics, okay. contraband uh, coming both in and out of the United States. Actually, that leads me to the very question I want to ask you about, because according to the DEA, cartels are responsible virtually for all of the fentanyl that's coming into this country. If you could speak to that and talk a little bit about how that has changed over the years and why at this point in time it is at its worst peak. So w when you look at fentanyl, uh, you know, it, it does have a medical use to it, but the illicit use is what we're talking about and uh, what's currently fueling uh, the opioid epidemic. So fentanyl as a quote unquote, uh, recreational drug, probably jumped on the scene maybe seven or eight years ago uh, at, uh, where, where it really came to a head. Uh, and when we initially found it, it was uh, through the dark net. So uh, most of the packages would be coming in from China, small amounts, China coming in. Uh, it wasn't until we saw a real shift in uh, 2019 when uh, China scheduled fentanyl drugs uh, fentanyl as a controlled substance in the country, where it sort of shifted towards the cartels in Mexico mass producing it uh, and thereby uh, shipping it back into the United States. Uh, currently now, you know, China is still uh, very involved in the production of precursor chemicals, which are the chemicals that are needed to produce uh, fentanyl. In addition to the, uh, the drug component of that, which we'll discuss in great detail as well, but Another thing that you cover, another tragic thing that you cover is the sextortion and this digital, sort of this digital mess that's out there. Um, everything that's sort of transnational with your organization, is that correct? Anything that happens beyond the boundaries of a city? That's correct. So uh, most of our investigations are transnational, meaning that they affect uh, not only the United States, but some of our uh, foreign partner countries, uh, for example, Canada, Mexico, uh, down in Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, all over the place. So anything that touches the United States that either originated from outside the country or originates in the United States and then thereby is uh, exported out of the United States, that's where uh, our, our bread and butter is. So you do cybercrime also? Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about how you sort of attack that? Because you were talking about how you handle border issues, and you're the investigative arm of 
Homeland Security, so there's a lot of boots on the ground on the border, but we're talking about digital and dark web, and I mean, how, how do you tackle that? Well, listen, I, I think when you, when you talk about cybercrime, uh, it's right in our bailiwick because uh, what the digital age and what the internet has done is uh, it's virtually online erased our borders, meaning, uh, you know, especially when it comes to sextortion, uh, you're talking about, you know, uh, social media and the role that uh, it plays in sextortion. Social media has opened up the world to our children. And I think what's important is, conversely, uh, that uh, by opening up uh, the world to our children, conversely, on that flip side of that same coin, is now the world is now opened up, uh, has now has access to our children. Well, I'm a parent. I have two kids. They're uh, young at this point. One's going to be five soon, the other eight. So sometimes I look at the world that's going on around me, right? And I'm in the news. I'm talking about horrible stories pretty much all day long. And part of me is relieved that I don't yet have to deal with some of the reality that most people are faced with. And at the same time, I'm also scared because I don't even really know how to go about it. So when you talk about protecting kids online, for example, I feel as though children are way ahead of most adults when it comes to what they're doing online. How do I keep up with that? What do I need to do? How can I play my role in a way to protect my kids? Well, it's, it's simple. I think it's become more involved. You have to be an expert in what your kids are doing, experts in technology. I'm in the same boat as you. Uh, I'm the father of an almost two-year-old. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, the, uh, what the future holds, if we're not more active in it, scares me as well. I think there's a fine balance between, uh, you know, within parenting, what's too much and what's not enough. And I think that's an individual parenting decision, but I think anyone that has a child that has, uh, it would be fooling themselves if they're not at some point going to have access to digital devices. And that scary reality means that we have to be more schooled as parents. Uh, I think we have to be more active in uh, searching for tools that will help us prevent some of this exploitation online. I think we have to be more active in our uh, school districts in speaking with uh, the, the school districts about providing educational opportunities. I think one of the great things that we do at HSI as a victim-centric uh, agency when it comes to these sort of crimes is that um, we place the victims first, meaning uh, the identification stabilization uh, of these victims is equally as important as the uh, prosecution and investigation. So part of that process is this public outreach uh, in allowing us to present ourselves uh, on a platform like this here, uh, but also we have a public outreach and an educational component for our agency that provides uh, tips and tools of the trade uh, for parents, uh, uh, interested community members. It's called iGuardian. Uh, the department is launching No to Protect, uh, which is its new uh, child sexual uh, exploitation initiative uh, later this month. So these are all things that uh, we as parents should be more proactive about. Like react, the days of reactive parenting are over, quite frankly. Now it's time to be more active and lean into this. We're talking about two programs that uh, HSI is rolling out and is responsible for. One of them is Know to Protect, and that's K-N-O-W, the number two, mm -hmm. Protect. Talk about that. So that is the uh, department's effort into raising awareness uh, on the dangers of uh, child sexual uh, exploitation material online, as well as uh, providing a platform uh, for uh, engagement between the public and the department. The second part is iGuardian, is, uh, which is specifically run by HSI, uh, where uh, we provide outreach to uh, whether it's schools, uh, civic organizations, non-governmental organizations, anyone that wants to learn a little more about uh, the dangers of sex, uh, sexploitation, child uh, sexual abuse material online. Uh, that's the uh, that's the program that we leverage to uh, 
uh, to, to, to meet with our uh, public counterparts. But what do each of these programs offer for a parent like myself? What would I, what would I be able to do with this? So I, 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 what, what they do is they give you sort of warning signs, okay. what we've seen throughout our cases, like best, uh, best practices as far as deploying technology in your home. Uh, let's say, for instance, you know, uh, where to place uh, computers, laptops, all that stuff. Uh, they'll also talk about uh, specific uh, uh, tools that you might use uh, as a parent uh, that would uh, help prevent uh, some of this uh, potential or prevent uh, your children from becoming potential victims of sextortion. Can I ask you, you're a federal organization, and uh, you know sometimes victims have a tough time dealing with law enforcement. And it's bad enough on the local level when a parent has to bring a child to a station or something like that. But when you get the feds involved, I mean, let's face it, you can be a little intimidating. How can you, I mean, you're smiling, but it's true, I mean, right? <laughs> I mean, the feds can be a little intimidating. So how sure. can you take something as sensitive as sexploitation or, or, or sextortion, something like that, and how can a parent and a child be comfortable with the feds? Listen, I, what I would say is when you see us, not not in a public outreach uh, arena, it's probably gonna be a pretty bad day, whether you're on the victim end or you're on the offender end. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I think what I would go back to is what we've evolved into as an investigative agency is a victim-centric uh, agency. And, and it goes back to understanding that if the victim is not comfortable, if the victim um, is not ready uh, to be a part of that restorative justice process, then there is no justice process. So we place equal emphasis, as I said, on uh, the stabilization, the identification stabilization, uh, and the rescue of the victims. That way, we can put them on that path towards restorative justice. I will tell you, we employ victim assistance specialists, uh, as well as forensic interviewers. So we understanding the sensitivity uh, surrounding the, the nature of this crime. We have specialized personnel that are trained in dealing with children, whether it's questioning them uh, to, to elicit statements, evidence, uh, uh, or is it uh, on the flip side to provide the victim services, right? Because as parents, we don't know what's all available to us. In fact, we don't know what we're entitled to as victims of a crime. So. Uh, that's how uh, our child exploitation investigative uh, unit and program has been built around those two services as the, as, as the foundation, and then from there, building our investigations upon that. What's the youngest victim that you've worked with? Me personally? The agency or yourself? The agency months, months. Yeah. Months old? Yeah. Months, months old. Months, months. So how, does, how do you go about in that situation, if a child is months old, incapable of really doing much or saying much. Right, a lot of that is gonna be based on digital evidence, right? Meaning uh, the sexual abuse, the child sexual abuse has already occurred. Uh, the offender has produced material uh, and we've uh, executed a law enforcement action on it, meaning we've conducted a search warrant, recovered that evidence and thereby we're able to walk it back to identify the victim, right? Looking at who that offender has been in contact with. Um, sadly, a lot of times we've seen, you know, I know there's, there's a preconceived notion of it's, uh, it's an older male living in their mother's basement and stuff like that. I can tell you right now that is absolutely not true. Uh, I think it does a disservice to parents if that's the way that we continue to think. Uh, in this digital age, an offender could be anyone, sadly, right? It could be a relative, it could be, you know, a friend, um, and sadly, it could even be a minor abusing another minor. You know, Agent, one of the reasons that I, we put this together is because there was a story you told me a long time back, and it was, it was a story of a young boy who had been lured into thinking that he was communicating with a young girl, who's think 14 years old, and um, th at some point, the conversation, the dialogue escalated. The young boy sends a nude selfie. 
Well, it ends up not being a girl that was 14 years old. It ends up being a guy in another country, Mm -hmm. some adult male in another country that turns around and says, I have these photos of you now. I'm going to release them to your priest, to your mom, your dad, your your scoutmaster, whomever, your your teachers. And then that's when the sextortion begins. Um, How bad is that type of activity? How bad is sextortion in this region? It... uh, I'd be lying to say if it wasn't a problem here. Uh, I, I can tell you that we've uh, identified dozens, uh, dozens upon dozens of victims here in the region. I, I, I young, think, young kids? I, I, what I would say on the sex torsion end of it, the financial sex torsion end of it, uh, they're more in the teenage, uh, the, the still adolescent. young people. Yes, young. So I, I think there's an important distinction here when we talk about sex torsion, right? So for the, from our investigations, we found that there's two different types of sex sextortions. Uh, first one being for uh, uh, power, uh, val- uh, power, control, uh, what the kids call clout online, right? And that's one type of sex sextortion. The other type is financial sex sextortion, which is what you were talking about, which is what you were referring to. So what we found there is that it's very similar to other 419 West African fraud schemes, romance, elder fraud. Uh, it's sort of kind of all mixed in there where the primary goal of that is to get money. Joining us now is Sergeant Peter Hish from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department's Fraud and Cyber Crimes Bureau. He's also joined with Agent Eddie Wong, who is the special agent in charge of Homeland Security Investigations in Los Angeles. Uh, Sergeant Hish, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having you. You're we were talking to Agent Wong before the break about um, uh, we're getting a little deeper into the sextortion around the Southern California region. Now, LA County, with it being so densely populated, how serious an issue is sextortion in LA County? It's serious. It, it's, it's prominent. We see these cases coming through our department quite a bit. And ages, I mean, is it all over the map or? Um, I would have to say what we're seeing predominantly is Kids in the range of 12 to 17 in there. In 12 that. year olds are victims of sextortion? Yeah, 12 to 17. Yeah, different, there's different types of sextortion, um, I guess, reasons why people sextort other people. But yeah, from, from that age on. More boys or girls? Um, I would have to say more boys than girls, yes. Is any particular reason why? Well, I don't have any scientific data to say one way or the other why, but I could say just from experience um, and being a young boy myself in the past, boys tend to be a little bit more um, involved in online uh, activity when it has to do with girls and, and sexual type of things mm-hmm. and exploring that, that, you know, that thing. So Walk us through a typical investigation. If someone were to report, like a parent were to report to you that they, they believed their child was the victim of sextortion, walk us through what that process would be. Sure. So unfortunately, just because of the, the sheer, um, or what, what uh, extor- or sextortion is, it can be quite embarrassing for not only the victim, but for the family to come forward to law enforcement. So oftentimes we see these cases coming in that are old, they're older. And when I say old, it, it just didn't happen today or yesterday or within the week. It's usually like uh, maybe a month or two down the road when the child actually has the guts or in a position to where they go to their parents finally. And then the family evaluates the situation and there's a time lapse there as well before they make the decision to come to law enforcement. So that's the first thing that we see is that delay it would be better for us if we get that notification right away while the sextortion is occurring and and we can jump at it quicker and hopefully get more evidence uh, easier. So that's how it starts. Of all the cases that you get, how successful are you in solving the cases or finding the perpetrator? Sure, so I guess it comes down to what's success. And actually, finding a perpetrator and putting them in jail is very, very rare. Mm -hmm. And we see that, the reason for that is many times the perpetrators are overseas. They're in other countries that we 
can't reach out to. We partner with the federal government a lot, HSI, we partner with them quite well, but they're limited too because some of these countries or most of these countries where, where, the, um, where the perpetrators are aren't friendly to the United States. So even our federal government has a difficult time reaching into those countries to, to find somebody. And keep in mind that these sextortions are not perpetrated by one person somewhere. Usually, they're a criminal organization in another country that are doing a lot of other scams, and this is just one of them. It's a whole office filled with people doing these scams, so it's not necessarily just one person. Mm -hmm. Agent Wong, before break, you were talking about there are two different types of sextortion, and, and Sergeant Hish was talking about it too. Can you give us a case or an example of each of those two types of extor uh, sextortion? Sure. So uh, we, we, we are currently investigating... Uh, cases into both types of those, so I'll take them. First one, I'll talk about the, the power and control uh, uh, sex torsion. Uh, their stated goal is to create child sexual abuse material, to uh, have one of the members of their online platform uh, coax someone into a suicide. Uh, so their, 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 their goals are very devious. Their go goal is not uh, for anything other than uh, online power uh, so that they can spread throughout uh, their, their, their sick community. And, and as Sergeant Hish was saying, these offenders are across the world. Uh, in this particular investigation that we're working with the United States Attorney's Office, uh, the top echelon of this organization, they're spread throughout the world. And that's what I talk about, what uh, the internet and online presence has done is that it's created, uh, it's knocked down all borders, it's knocked down all of that stuff. So this is that one community and attributed that to, to, to that one particular investigation, uh, I believe we have one suicide uh, that was captured online that was uh, run live time in real time to uh, the members uh, so they could see it. I think there was another homicide committed on behalf of the uh, the and community they, as well. And it, so these individuals are forced into doing this by uh, people from another country? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what was the end game? What was, it, was it just the, the, the sick, twisted nature of what they were doing, or was there a transaction involved? No, tra so this is no financial transaction, but uh, this was under the threat of releasing uh, embarrassing photographs, right? So that's, that's the sextortion, right? That's the blackmail portion of it where it has nothing to do with financial. What, what would your advice then be for someone who is falling into this trap? Because, I, I mean, the more they play along with this individual or individuals, the end game isn't gonna work in their favor anyway. So you just have to put a stop to it and come to uh, law enforcement, right? You hit, it, you hit the nail right on the head. As difficult as it may sound at that time, uh, I think all of us can remember a time when we were adolescents mm -hmm. thinking the world that was five inches in front of us was our entire world, uh, realize, not realizing that there was a whole future out there. I think uh, especially all of us as not only parents, but community members, uncles, cousins, and all that, the most important thing I would say is that you have to, have to provide an off-ramp for these children that are in this because as you said, this will quickly spiral out of control. Uh, and, and then the unfortunate outcomes uh, far outweigh any embarrassment. Sergeant Hish, what platforms are we talking about here? You know, you hear the agent talking about a very graphic situation. How are these criminals accessing these children? Simply put, any platform that's on the internet, on your phone, any app, that has the ability to communicate with another person. So we, we think of, okay, maybe Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram. Um, TikTok. TikTok, uh, but that's not the only ones. There's even simple chat. I don't know if, if the audience or your listeners have experienced this in the past, but maybe gotten a, a random text from somebody that says, and your name's Steve, but it says, hey Mike, how you doing, right? And that's it. Well, hoping that you would respond back and then from there, they set the hook and continue the conversation. Oh, sorry, uh, Mike, I was looking for Steve or vice versa, And uh, but how's your day going? And, and continue, and then over days or even weeks, 
foster that simple communication into a sextortion incident. And links are also a big part of that too, right? Links can be, can, can also, like links a Trojan are, horse almost. Uh, yeah. They, they can be uh, used that way as well, yeah. What I wanted to ask also, uh, Sergeant, you were talking about specific platforms. Is there any one platform that's more susceptible to this kind of activity than another one? There's one platform that's a little bit different because it kind of lulls the victim into a sense of, uh, I guess, a, a safety, and that's Snapchat. And the reason I say that is because Snapchat allows you to take a picture, send it, and the recipient only has a certain amount of time to view it, right? So that would lead the, the sender to, b to believe that, oh, I'll send this picture to them, but they can't do anything with it because it's gonna disappear after a minute, two minutes, or whatever it is. But that's not necessarily true. Once the, the, the receiver gets the photo on their phone, they can just take another phone and take a picture of it, and now they have it, right? Or screenshot it. It, it will notify the sender that it was screenshotted, but um, it, it, it's not gone forever. Anything, what's important to remember about the internet, anything sent on the internet at any time is on the internet forever, period. So Snapchat can be a little misleading, but all the apps, even gaming apps, that are Discord and things like that can that have an ability to have a chat or communication, send files, are used in, in these uh, crimes. This happens all the time where people even post something, immediately take it down and think, oh, it's deleted, mm. it's gone. There's no such thing as you said. The digital mm. footprint is something that exists for each person now. That is the reality we live in. So you have to be careful, especially for young people, because once they start having a digital footprint, it follows them forever and it can impact their future, whether they're trying to get a job later or just whatever it is they're trying to do, this follows them forever. You're absolutely correct. And that's very important that you just pointed out that just because it happened now, when you're 22, 23, 24, and you're trying to get a job, especially in a, in a, a big company, they all do social media reviews mm -hmm. and they pull these things out. And keep in mind that although it may not, you may have deleted it off of Instagram or Facebook, there are, companies out there that go and scrape this information and store it. So once it's out there, this company, this independent company goes out and scrapes all this and stores it. So now it's available to be put back on the internet at any time. Let's go to the audience now. We have the ability to ask some questions here of our guests and uh, Jacob, who we got in the back? I just wanted to, can you hear me? Sure. I just wanted to ask, is, is there like privacy legislation that gets in your way, like from investigating and apprehending like perpetrators? Oh, I'm Dave from Irvine, by the way. Okay. Thanks, Dave. For me, uh, there, yeah. the First Amendment is a big one. <laughs> People are allowed to do a lot of things. Our First Amendment is very strong. And uh, that, that allows for people to do quite a bit of, of crime. However, the Fourth Amendment follows that just as strong with the right to, to privacy and our, and our ability to do certain things to find out who, who, who's doing the crime. So I don't want to call them obstacles because the First and the Fourth Amendment are very important for us as Americans. It, it's, it's the foundation of who we are. But we just have, it slows us down because there are certain things that we have to do to ensure that we're following the law, that we're, we're getting the necessary um, things from the courts to be able to move further. So yeah, the, the, uh, the, the Constitution slows us down, but I don't want to paint that in a negative way. It's very important for all of us to have those in place, but they can be obstacles at times. Okay, we've got another question coming to us from the audience. Hi. Hi, my name's Lyle from Hacienda Heights. I'm a high school teacher, and I see kids on their phones constantly throughout the day through our classes. And you mentioned, Agent Wong, about educating our parents when these children are very young. I feel like the message may be taught, but it's not carried out through all of these years when they enter high school, get to high school. And my question is, I guess, what would be a, um, a good way to educate these kids now that they're with us in high school? 
So uh, the great thing about iGuardian is that uh, the agency has uh, understood exactly what you're talking about. So there's separate tracks for each one of those programs uh, uh, geared towards each one of those audiences. I think it's there, there's one for the very young uh, and one for uh, those gaining, uh, getting in, uh, into adolescence and stuff like that. And there are two different things because I think there's the, I think Sergeant Hish talked about it and I think you talked about it earlier about um, having that digital footprint that stays there forever. Uh, <clears throat> yes, that is true, but there's some very innovative programs right now uh, that, you know, one of the leaders in this area, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, there's a, there's a program out there right now, it's called uh, Take It Down. So what it is, is uh, it's the ability for self-generated child sexual abuse material. So what we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, if you're pretending, uh, if you're sending uh, uh, compromising photographs of yourself to someone else and you generated that yourself, and, and the individual happens to place it on the internet, uh, there's a cooperative agreement uh, among some of the electronic service providers where if uh, we provide them with the image or the, 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 the child or, or the adolescent provides them with that image, they can go to those providers and they can track it, uh, track it down and then take them down. But it doesn't do any good if it's scraped already, right? So uh, that's one of the things that is evolving. So. That's one of the things that we would really, really like to get out to the high school students, right? Uh, it's the first, the first measure, the first point, the most important point is prevention. And the second point is, hey, it's not the ultimate thing. There are things that we can do to try and help out. Does that help? Did it answer your question? Yes. Okay, very good. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is David from uh, Temecula. Uh, question is for Sergeant Hish and also Agent Wong. Um, I get the text messages probably every day from somebody random that's fishing for, hey, hey, Claire, are we having lunch on Thursday, right? Um, you know, and obviously I just send them straight to junk. But um, we've all seen the To Catch a Predator shows, right? And there's, you know, a team that is specifically set up to pose as victims and, and hopefully try and track down these bad guys. Uh, my question to either of you is, is there a federal program or a state or local program that has a team of people that do this, that specifically poses young people to try to capture, you know, these bad guys? If so, how successful has it been? And if not, why not? Uh, you go first? On yeah, sure. Uh, th there's, uh, there's certainly a lot of efforts uh, that HSI Los Angeles and HSI offices all across the country uh, employ, including the use of undercover decoys. We work very closely with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department to do this. Uh, as far as success, it's all successful, right? Any time that we're able to take a predator off the street for any period of time is successful. The problem here is the, uh, the volume of these leads and tips. So what I'll tell you is what we've seen uh, from COVID especially, during the lockdown, the isolation of kids, uh, and then the need to have validation or acceptance, we've seen the number of cyber tips that we get explode. So for instance, let's say in, uh, I, I think it was calendar year 2020, uh, actually 2019, there were 16 million cyber tip leads, way too many. Uh, I think in, uh, 2021, uh, no, in 2020, it's like r right when COVID started and it increased a lot, but we really saw the, the, the rapid increase in uh, calendar year 2021, where it went up to just under uh, 30 million. And now we're a lot in, in calendar year 2022, uh, the National Center for Missing and Explo Exploited Children uh, captured uh, 32 million cyber tip leads. So the number is not going down. Uh, the problem here is that law enforcement, we're only part of the solution, right? And with 32 million leads, we're not going to arrest our way out of this. And I just want to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit more on what Special Agent Wong was talking about um, regarding resources. 
there are millions of, of leads. We get them, we tips all the time. We're, hey, look at this. I got this email. I got this text and all, all kinds of things. The, the victims or the receivers of these texts know it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, a fraud or a scam, but they, so it's, but they want to report it to us anyways. So we get those. But over the last few years, four years or so, our resources in law enforcement, especially in LA County, have been degraded quite a bit. So the resources that we have right now to put into investigating these things is very limited. We have to really pick and choose and, and see out of all these things that we have to investigate, what can we latch on to and be successful with? And unfortunately, it's a very, very small percentage of the overall crime that's being committed. Very good. Let's go back to questions in the audience. Hi, um, Yvonne, Simi Valley. Um, I'm also a parent to an eight and a six-year-old, so thank you for your question. I'm not quite there yet, but uh, to the two gentlemen, I'm also a nurse by profession, and I work um, as a school nurse as well with middle school, and I have been witness to things that have happened, and I'm curious how cooperative our school districts, uh, I'm kind of asking for Ventura County specifically, but how cooperative are school districts in helping you both accomplish what needs to be accomplished? Because it's happening on campuses. School districts. We, I could talk about one case that we've we've taken in rather recently, and it has to do not necessarily with sextortion, but it's more of a bullying and threat type of thing that's happening on social media. And the the education code uh, mandates the school districts to have some kind of a bullying, anti-bullying policy and procedure, right? So they look at it from a, an administrative standpoint, which is good because that gives the school dis districts more teeth if they're able to identify the, uh, the perpetrator to suspend them if they're a student and, and those types of things, which, which is good. As far as them cooperating with us, it, it's, it's fairly good um, for the most part. It's just, I think, um, there's two different, I guess, perspectives on how something should be dealt with. If we get involved, it, it goes a completely different way. Now you're talking criminal, right? And now... Minors and versus parents. You know, you have minors, because these are middle school children that are under 18, and then right. you have parents. Yes. And sometimes they come to me first, say, hey, can you assess this, this child and see if you see any signs? And uh -huh. then you have to get parents involved. It, it's yeah. a very well, taxing. talking about parents involved, that's the best circumstance. I think parents have a lot more power and ability to get things done and, and to benefit their children with the school districts than law enforcement does. When we get involved, we're looking at it from a very uh, narrow, through a very narrow lens that's criminal. Okay, D did the elements of this crime occur? Yes or no? Is there evidence? Yes, no. Is there a, 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 a victim, a suspect? Yes or no? Put that all together, give it to the prosecutor to prosecute, right? That, it, it's, it's a very linear type of uh, process with us. But with, when parents get involved, and if they believe that, that the school district is not um, complying with that education code or not doing the things they need to do in the schools to ensure their child's safety, then I think parents could get very, very loud with the, uh, the school districts to get them on board. I, I, in my opinion, the parents in this case have a lot more power and ability to get things done than we do. Excellent. If I can actually add to this, um, it seems as though, you know, obviously the saying, it takes a village, right, to do anything, especially with raising kids. But also when we're dealing with these different aspects, for example, something that happened in a home where these girls were friends. This is actually a recent news story. These girls were friends. There was some argument when, you know, they had a falling out. One of them went to take a shower. That other girl went and took pictures of her while she was in the shower. Then at school, spread the image of this girl. So now you're talking about something that happened in a home, but now you're talking about how to deal with this on campus where other children are having access to this image, right? So there's so many, so many things are happening now where it's not just one situation, one place, one scenario. Now more people are involved and uh, you're dealing with different places. How do you, how do you go about dealing with something like this? Well, in that case, we have to break it down to its most simplest terms. One, something happened in the home, right? Right. Was that child a minor? 
if yes, then a crime was committed in the home, that, that's a production of child pornography in home, right? But then that person took it to the school. In the school, they spread it. That's the distribution of child pornography in the school. So it happened in both places. So you have two separate crimes happen in two different places. From a law enforcement perspective, we're gonna look at that and, and, and investigate it like that. From, from the home aspect, the parents need to be involved at home to, to see what their children are doing at home and the, the school district needs to jump on, if, if that victim reported it to her teacher, this is happening, the school district should jump on that right away. Pull the parents in, pull us in, and, and get that uh, taken care of immediately. So it's, it's, from our perspective, it's one thing, happened in two places, but there are two different sides of the prevention. When, when do the feds get involved in something like this? When does it escalate to your desk? So I, so when we talk about sheer numbers, I think Sergeant Hish talked about it. I could put every single special agent that works for me working child sexual uh, abuse material investigations, and we'd still have way too many uh, leads to go after. So from our perspective, wh where we get uh, involved is, so we house the uh, Los Angeles Police Department's Internet uh, Crimes Against Children Task Force in our uh, in our office in Long Beach. Uh, from there, uh, we'll take cases that have international nexus, whether the offender uh, is a U.S. citizen that's committing child exploitation or sexual uh, assault offenses in foreign places, or uh, uh, that there's a foreign nexus to it. Uh, I think we do a lot more of the uh, production and hands-on offenses. Because when you look at it from the, from the perspective of sentencing, right, so actually holding offenders accountable, this is where the federal system really comes in, and that's where a lot of times it, it's advantageous to have, uh, whether it's Homeland Security investigations or another federal entity looking at it, because the sentencing uh, guidelines are that much higher. So when we work with the U.S. Attorney's Office, you know, on the state side, it may be uh, possibly a wobbler between a misdemeanor or a felony. With, uh, with us, it's a felony. Yeah. And when it, you're doing a felony fed time, you're going to do real time, and you're going to pro probably do upwards of 85% of that time. So that's, that, that's where we're brought in as more of the hammer when we look at these investigations. Got it. I think we have time for one more question before this segment ends. Hi, um, this is James from uh, La Puente. Um, a lot of these uh, crimes have obviously been committed online and used through technology. Um, has there been any use of AI um, in terms of tracking down these criminals? Um, has that been, uh, you know, has AI been any, any help or been useful in any real world scenario in catching these criminals a lot faster and tracking them down? So, so uh, artificial intelligence is evolving. Uh, we're, we're trying to keep up with that sort of technology. Uh, we're certainly uh, speaking with industry experts when it comes to uh, what, uh, what tools are available and what the future holds. I would say, you know, for that question, like, hey, what are we doing? What can AI do to help? I think we also have to consider the other flip side of the coin when it comes to AI and what AI has done on the child sexual abuse material front where now you can create images uh, pornographic images, whether it's actual ch child sexual abuse material and then swapping faces and there. Uh, so, you know, that's, that, that's the scary part of anything with technology. Yes, it does make right. life better, but there's, there's a seedy underside to that uh, where we have to be careful uh, about deploying uh, that sort of technology uh, and understanding what that technology is capable of. Welcome back to the KFI News Special, Sex, Drugs, and Social Media. I'm Steve Gregory, along with Aroxy Carpathian from Fox 11 here in Los Angeles. Our next guest now is the owner of Cyber Safety Cop, Clayton Cranford, joins us now remotely. Uh, Clayton, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Clayton, let's talk about this, because um, you're former law enforcement, so tell us a little bit about your career, because it's very interesting, and I think it fits perfectly for what we're talking about. Yeah, I was a, a law enforcement officer for 20 years. I worked for the Orange County Sheriff's Department. I was a school resource officer, uh, a juvenile detective. I was on our county's behavioral threat assessment team. 
And as a sergeant, I ran our drug education program. And all of those things all had the internet involved. Um, but as a school resource officer back in 2012, uh, I was faced daily with students and with parents who were in situations and they weren't prepared for them. Uh, usually the situations were really, really horrible as your earlier segment kind of outlined. And so I wanted to come up with an idea that we could help students and parents to better manage these situations and maybe prevent them. So what does Cybersecurity Cop do? So we travel all of the United States and we talk to students in assemblies K through 12. And we also speak to parents and parent education. And uh, we try to do it in a way where we are impacting those students on a really emotional level. So what we've, what we've realized is that after doing this for 12 years, it's not what kids know. Kids know everything. They know all the internet safety rules. If you ask them, uh, give them a quiz on internet safety, they're gonna pass 100%. The problem is what they believe. And they believe that their real world and their digital world are two different worlds. So we try to talk to them in a way and tell them stories that kind of hits them down more in here. And so they ch maybe changes the way they think about it. And then the other part is parents. We need parents to get radically involved in their child's digital world. So we want to give them the tools and resources to do that. You know, we had a question from the audience with our previous guest talking about uh, the interaction with school districts and, and parents and um you know, there's this, this is a time now where parents seem to be either overly aggressively involved in what's going on at their schools or they're still pretty passive about it. What are you experiencing with school districts that once you've counseled about, um, you know, that interaction between the district and the parent? Because sometimes those two things never align. Well, I think parents just don't know what they don't know. And maybe that's the biggest issue because it's not mandatory. They don't have to bring me or one of my instructors to their school and talk to the parents. Many do because they are concerned about this issue. But the problem is that even when they have these opportunities, parents aren't coming. Parents don't think this is a problem. They don't think their child's going to be a victim. And this is a fundamental misbelief. They need to understand. Every parent needs to understand that you have a great kid. But under the right set of circumstances online, they can be a victim. Well, I was just talking, uh, interesting enough, to one of our audience members of the, about the fact that as a parent, you control what you can control, right? And you feel like, okay, I'm raising my kid right. I've laid the foundation. I've armed them with what they need to do when they're out in the real world. What becomes complicated and difficult and scary all in one is when outside forces now have... Uh, influence over your child and that you can't control, right? So now you're in a situation where maybe you did everything right, but out there in the world, they can easily take the wrong path. I know a lot of parents who did everything right and their child was a victim. And what I mean by everything right is that they love their child, they talk to their kid, but they're missing a couple of pieces. So one thing is have a, a conversation with your child so that they feel um, that they can talk to you and ask for help. But also, you know, you need to cover certain issues about sexting, what are these, you know, sextortion looks like. You need to have those conversations. And the other piece is understand what's actually happening. So turn on parental controls, you know, install an application on their device that runs in the background and looks for problems. We recommend a, 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 an app called Our Pact. It's one of the simplest and most important things you can do as a parent because your kid could be in a situation, make one bad choice, right? They send that image they shouldn't send. Now they can't get it back. And I've had a parent who had a kid who did that at 10 p.m. And because they were bombarded with messages from this extorter for hours, by 6 a.m., their child took their own life. That parent could have made a difference if they knew what was going on. So it's beyond just what your child knows or those conversations you had, which are important, but you need to be able to intercede. And maybe the only way to do that is having that kind of firsthand knowledge what's going on with their device. Clayton, talk about that. You, were, you made reference to a, a, is it an app or software? Yeah, it's an app. It's called Our Pact, O-U-R-P-A-C-T. Got it. And it's really a no-brainer. Like literally for the cost of one Starbucks run a month, you can keep your kids safe. Um, it, it, it'll grab screenshots, it will analyze what they're doing, it will let you know, and maybe that's the most important thing. All of my stories boil down to a good kid who made a bad choice and a parent who did not know what was going on. Well, I think also, you know, technology is developing at a rapid pace, faster than we can keep up with, right? And so now 
we're exposed to so much more at such a level that it's hard to fathom what's happening and understand what's happening. And so what happens is sometimes you're right, we become passive or we think it won't happen to us until it does. So I think the theme that I've noticed with the guests we've had thus far is that we can't wait for something to happen and then react to it. We have to really take this proactive approach and prevent anything before it actually happens. And that comes on us as parents. That's our job now to arm ourselves with the tools that are out there. And, and many of the things that were mentioned today, I have to admit that I'm not even familiar with most of this. Um, so if I'm not even familiar with it and I'm in the news and I'm pretty much just think of myself as knowing a little bit about what's going on, it, it's pretty scary to be sitting here and, and hearing these things for the very first time. There's always something new and right, this is the challenge. So I would encourage parents go to my website, cybersafetycop.com. You can sign up for a free membership. We will send you an email every other week about something you need to know, a new app, new technology, how to talk to your kid about it. We have resources for you and your child because one of the other issues too is not just awareness, but actually making a child who is resilient. Your child needs to know what the problems look like, but also what to do if they get into it and get into some situation of trouble, they don't know how to get out of it. They need to know what to do. You know, I kept thinking back to when I was in high school, um, back when pagers were all the rage. Um, <laughs> But when I think about the smartphone now, um, and, and I think about how valuable that tool is, especially, unfortunately, we have to deal with active shooter scenarios. We have to deal with other scenarios that are going on. That communications between the parent and the child is pretty critical, pretty crucial. I think now we've, parents are used to having that, that, uh, that connection. But at the same time, those phones have turned into sort of a, a nightmare, right? Uh, but, oh, without a doubt. So, and so I'm trying we, to think back to when I was in school, and now that's a that's a whole host of new problems. Yeah, we have parents giving their children phones at younger and younger ages. Um, we never used to do a K through three presentation when I started doing this 12 years ago, and it was a handful of years ago, maybe five or eight years ago, we started doing it because these kids have phones. Parents are giving their children phones because they think this is making my child more safe. But what they don't realize is they're opening up this world to their child that would never have been available to them without that device. So I do, I'm, my, may perhaps my most important like tip I can give a parent is wait as long as you can. Do not give them a phone until they actually need it. Don't give them social media until maybe they're in high school. The, there's no downside to doing it. In fact, there's a huge upside. And we know that through lots of research that the earlier you give a child advice and the earlier they get social media, the more it negatively impacts their mental health. And it opens them up to drug access through drug dealers. The number one cause of death for young children is drug overdose. Number two is suicide. And we're shoving phones in our children's hands at much too young ages and we're not thinking about the consequences. So what age would you recommend someone give their child a phone? I, I'm thinking back, I think I didn't get one until I learned how to drive. That's not a bad call. In fact, uh, I would encourage a parent to wait. And if you want to wait till your child's 16, I don't think that's a bad call. What I did in my home was when my boys were in middle school, I gave them a flip phone. It gave me the ability to call them and text them, but they didn't have access to the internet. A lot of parents are choosing um, uh, internet connect or sorry, phone connected watches, like an Apple device, Apple Watch. This is a choice that would allow you to call your kid and track them without having to, giving them access to the internet or a phone with a camera. We've been talking with Clayton Cranford. He's the owner of Cyber Safety Cop. Great information about the counseling he does and the consulting he does with school districts around the country. He is also a former law enforcement school resource officer, a juvenile investigator, uh, threat assessment uh, officer as well. Uh, uh, Clayton, in your role doing threat assessment, what were some of the biggest red flags that you were noticing in schools? I mean, what are the, in, in, in what ages? I, there was a stat one time, I was doing a story with the LA County Department of Mental Health, and there was at one time, when I went to do the story, there were 41 credible threats on, with young people in school districts, whether they were harming themselves or harming others. There were 41 credible threats at that time that they didn't want the public to know about. Um, talk about some of the threat assessment that you do and, and, and how that is involved in the school districts. Yeah, and actually, I travel all the United States training school districts how to do behavioral threat assessments. So probably the number one 
sign is going to be leakage. They're going to be talking about homicidal thoughts or and sometimes sometimes suicidal thoughts. And those things will be produced in social media, conversations with people not the intended victim. And so it's just just things that are, you know, you know, words or images of concern is usually what gets somebody on our radar. And then once we start digging in, we tend to see someone who's um, very interested in weapons. Maybe they have a grievance. There's an issue going on that they feel like violence is their solution. And, uh, and often there's an interest in other um, past school shooters. And we find out a lot about that by digging into their social media, looking into their Internet um, search history. We have a question in the audience now. Um, Jacob's heading over there now. Hi, I'm a teacher in LA County, and I guess two part, twofold. Do you is is your outreach beyond Orange County, and can you describe a little bit about your outreach? Is it to the administration of districts? Is it to students within? school districts and schools, uh, professional development for teachers, et cetera? Yes, well, we go everywhere. So we travel all over the United States. Uh, and when it comes to our training, we do an educational piece for educators and administration, so professional development. But we also then do community outreach presentations for students and for parents. And we can do those at schools. We might do them at a church. And when we talk to students, about social media. We also do a presentation about vaping, marijuana, and fentanyl. But when we talk about social media, we talk about three big ideas. Number one, the real world and the digital world are the same world. We talk about sextortion and sexting and the reputation consequences and the potential issues. And then we talk about threats. And then lastly, we talk about how to create a positive online reputation. So try to take it and end with a positive because our children are going to get uh, going to be given social media at, at some point, and we need to make sure that they understand that their digital footprint matters. Well, you were mentioning uh, some of the topics and how you present the research that you have to students. You said you tried to tell them stories that actually gets them, I guess, emotionally, right? Can you give some examples of what that would look like? Yeah, I mean, all the stories we're telling are stories from our experiences as investigators, as counselors. But, you know, when we talk about, you know, we're, we're talking to a group of high school students and we're talking about not sending an intimate image of yourself to another person, someone you know or don't know, but often they're sending to people they do know and those images get out. So we just say, you know, like, look, if, if you're in high school and you're dating somebody, is that a relationship that's going to last forever? And, and you, everybody, in the, everybody in the audience, you know, I got a, a gymnasium of 800 students are all cracking up. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's sooner or later you're going to break up. I don't want to ruin the romance, but it's not going to work out. But if that image is given to that person, that image doesn't break up. It goes on forever. So you need to ask yourself kind of a grown-up question, which is, what do I have to lose? And a couple of years ago, we had a young girl, actually a young woman, just graduated college, reaches out to me and she says, I gave a, an image to my college boyfriend because I loved him. We broke up and now that image is on a website. She contacted that website. She said, this is my image. You don't have permission to take it down. And they said, we'll take it down for $1,000. And she called me. She said, can you help me? I said, well, where's this website? And as it turns out, it's in a different country. So I said, ultimately law enforcement can do nothing for you. And then she asked, should I give them the money? And I'll ask, High school students, should she give them the money? And they all say no. So she's left with a situation that she cannot fix. And the question our students need to be asking themselves is, what does this mean to me? What do I have to lose? And this poor young woman in the end said, maybe I can change my name. Wow. Are you seeing that a lot then, Clayton? Uh, that's pretty interesting to me. We just had uh, someone from Homeland Security Investigations on, and we were talking about transnational crime and how this sort of fits into that mold. And um, are you saying that they're, they're, our federal government wouldn't be able to intervene or help in that situation? No, because if it's a, if it's a, this is in a government that's not friendly to us, like, you know, the Ivory Coast or something like that, th th they can't do a whole lot. So I think, in fact, this one was in, I think, in a Southeast Asia country. But, but the point is, is that getting something down is going to be nearly impossible. Um, 
and, and the problem is our children can't think about what's happening next. They're thinking about what, how do I feel right now? They have underdeveloped prefrontal cortexes. They're really kind of bound up with their dopamine, like what makes me feel good right now and what's exhilarating. And they're more likely to make uh, dis bad decisions because they're taking risks and chances. And unfortunately, these risks and chances now last forever. Well, most of, the, most of the time, young people are living for the present, right? And very few of them are thinking long-term in the future. But Steve mentioned the pagers, and it made me think about when I was growing up. And in a junior high and high school, we had the program D.A.R.E., and I'm sure you're familiar with D.A.R.E., uh, being former law enforcement yourself, and what a program that was and how much that has changed to now what you're going to schools and talking to them about. And the most exciting thing for us was we had one of our um, students who had – a cigar burn, I remember, on his arm. And so he would show these younger students when we'd go to speak to the kids about, you know, don't smoke, don't do drugs, don't drink. That was the extent of it. He would show his little cigar burn and everyone would be just so shocked by it. And it was enough to seal the deal, like maybe you should stay away from cigarettes and smoking. But now we're talking about something completely different and it's almost hard to understand how to approach it because we never dealt with this. Most of us mm. in this room have no idea still what's going on out there. I had Polaroids. <laughs> yeah, or you did things, you know, when you were a kid and now it's just a rumor because there was no social media when we were kids. No, the, the message of D.A.R.E., which was meant in the best possible way, which was just don't do drugs, didn't work. If you tell a child drugs are bad, the first time they try drugs, that's not their experience. Their experience is that they're amazing, right? The reason people do drugs is because they feel good. The reason why people share nude images with people, other people online is because it's exciting. There's a lot of dopamine happening here. The conversation we have with our children is not is, is a real conversation, which is immediately this, this is the payoff. The payoff is dopamine. But the long-term consequences, those are what we need to talk about. The rest of that story. And, you, and we share a story with students where we give them the rest of that story. And, and maybe that's how we can kind of change the way they think about it. We've been speaking with Clayton Cranford, the owner of Cyber Safety Cop. He's also the author of the book, Parenting in a Digital World. Clayton, before the break, we were talking a little bit about um, some of the challenges you have in schools and, and trying to get that message into young people, underdeveloped minds. Uh, tell us a story or do you have a case study where uh, a success story, where you had a situation where a young person was kind of on the cliff or on edge, and then uh, you were able to reach that person. Yeah, so we've had a student who, uh, um, she had a sixth grade boyfriend who asked her to send him a nude image to prove he, she was in a committed relationship. And unfortunately she did that. Um, the, res the result of that was that image then being shared with multiple boys at that school. And the night leading up to her first day in seventh grade, she got multiple messages from those boys saying, we have this image of you, now send us an image. So in a way she's being sextorted here by, by her peers. So she shows up to school the next day and she went into my office because I was the school resource officer in that school and I had a relationship with those students. And she came in there, she says, I, I made a mistake, I need help. Um, our kids are gonna make bad choices, like that's a given but they need to know what to do. Like, how do, how do I manage this situation that I'm in? I want students to know that they're not alone. So whether that's um, a parent, hopefully it's a parent, but maybe another adult in your child's life. And I think parents should sit down with their kid and have a conversation with them and say, look, if you make a mistake, in fact, I kind of expect you to, no matter what it is, no matter how embarrassing it is, I want you to come to me and ask for help. And maybe ask your student, if it wasn't me, if it was something that you didn't feel comfortable talking to me about because you're afraid or scared, is there another adult that you have at that school that you trust that you could go to? Because our parents love our kids, but there are some things your child may not feel comfortable talking to you about. They, they're afraid that they're going to disappoint you. So I hope your child has another adult at that school that they could do that with. From your experience, what is the number one thing or situation that you're constantly dealing with? Is there one specific type of a case that repeats itself like a trend? Well, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of mean, rude and 
um, negative stuff happening online. And this is what children call the drama. Like if you ask a kid, you know, what's going on, they'll say, well, it's just a bunch of drama. So no child online, no child on social media is going to be unaffected. You think, well, my kid doesn't have, you know, Snapchat, they don't have all this stuff. But if they're online, they are swimming around in this stuff and it is going to affect them. And so they need to be able to, you need to talk to them, they need to be able to talk to somebody about it. But then it can escalate into some pretty rough stuff. And then we also are dealing with threats. There's a lot of threatening behavior happening online. And we, I investigated a lot of them. And most of them didn't amount to a credible threat, but it does create a fear response in that student. And it's really difficult to be educated when you're in fear. And our children today, more than any other time in 20 years, are struggling with mental health. They are anxious and they're scared and depressed. And social media is like kerosene being thrown on that fire. How many uh, schools do you talk to on average in a year or in a month? Uh, we probably talk to 300 schools in a year. We have five or six instructors, and we're speaking at a school almost literally every day of the week. And are you noticing this problem or the series of problems in any particular part of the country or more than any other part? No, I think it's a kind of a global issue. Uh, I speak to students on the East Coast and the West Coast, and the, and the problems are all the same. And again, a parent who is engaged in their child's life, but not in their digital world, is missing a huge problem. The, the chances of your child being a victim of physical violence is lower now than it ever has. But nearly 83% of all human trafficking and sexual exploitation cases begin on a child's device. So we need to kind of take our eyeballs as a parent and turn them in on our child's digital world and be involved in that. I'm sorry, you said 83% of human trafficking? All, yeah, in 2022, all active human trafficking and sexual exploitation cases began on a mobile device. Wow, what was the youngest age that you're aware of that this has occurred with? Very young. So I have students, let's see, about every week I have a parent calling me and asking for advice. So I had a parent call me not too long ago. His his seven-year-old is on Roblox, which is an online game. It's similar to, similar to Minecraft. And he's messaging with another player who he thinks is a, someone his age, but it turns out it's an adult who's having a very sexually explicit conversation with their child. And that parent did not know about this until they went to my presentation. And I said, you need to be looking into your child's gaming and who they're chatting with. He goes home and looks at his child's Roblox uh, chat history and his life is shattered. So there's a lot going on, even with our very little kids, that we need to kind of get, wrap our brains around. And, and my website will give you the tools to do that. My book will walk you through it step by step. You don't have to be an expert. You just have to be engaged. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned gaming because one of our audience members was asking about that very topic. In fact, if you would like to ask your question right now, um, Jacob, if we could get oh, he's, in. Oh, he walked Jacob away. Jacob walked away, yeah. Tell me the question and I'll. So just um, how to be aware of the dangers of gaming. So we have a 16-year-old um, male, and I want to know how to um, not investigate but be aware of his conversation, his activity on Fortnite, okay. Call of Duty, whatever. Okay. So the question is, they have a 16-year-old boy, and they want to know how to be aware of the dangers of gaming. How do they, as parents, know what he's up to? How do they, I guess, walk that fine line where they don't, he doesn't feel like you're watching and no, hovering exactly. over him. Yeah. At the same time, you kind of are without him knowing what's going on, so you're trying to keep him safe and be aware. All of hey, I encourage parents to invade their child's privacy. If you don't want your child's private, if you want your child's privacy to be zero, it should be. Like you have the moral and legal right to do it. So and you can blame me, it's totally fine. Um, with regards to social or no, social, with regards to gaming, almost all these games have parental controls. So I would encourage you to go to my website. I have a page on my website that, that rates and reviews games. Uh, my book and also my website has step-by-step um, -step guides on the parental controls, especially Fortnite and Roblox and Minecraft. Uh, commonsensemedia.org also has excellent resources and tools for you that, that would help kind of fill in the gaps that I don't have. 
But when it comes to some games like uh, Call of Duty, you're not going to have as much control because those games are for, supposed to be for teens and those games don't build that in. So Roblox and Minecraft, they have a reason to create more parental controls in there and to protect children because it's really skewing to a younger age. When my boys who are now in college, uh, when they were playing uh, Minecraft, I had that dialed pretty tightly. I, I knew what was going on. I could control who could communicate with them. But when they're playing Call of Duty, I, I didn't have that level of control. So what I would do is I would pop in in the area that they're playing this game and listen to what's going on. You, you might be concerned at the kind of things that people are seeing in these gaming environments. It can be very, very caustic. But also, you need to also be comfortable with your child in those environments and understand that, or more importantly, that they understand that they cannot be sharing their personal information with the people that they're playing if they're playing in an open kind of gaming environment. Clayton, I appreciate your time very much. We, we have gotten a lot from this. It's amazing information. Again, that's Clayton Cranford, owner of Cyber Safety Cop. And he's got a book called Parenting in a Digital World. And you can get in touch with him through cybersafetycop.com. Clayton, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Much appreciated. Very thank you, everybody. In this next couple hours, we're going to talk about the drug trade and how social media has helped to exacerbate it. One of the individuals that can really dig deep in this topic is Bill Bodner. He is most recently known as a special agent in charge for the DEA here in Los Angeles very recently retired, and now, Bill, you have a private company, you're a consultant, tell us all about that. Sure, uh, right now I started a business called Revelo Investigations and Consulting, and we do work, uh, private investigative work, consulting work, a lot of it still focuses on the drug space, but uh, it's been interesting, it's been definitely uh, a change, so it's been healthy, healthy retirement from DEA. Well, and one of the reasons I wanted to have you here, and, and Roxy and I wanted to talk to you, is that you, you spent so many years, not only in the service of the federal government, but in the DEA and in our many interviews together, yep. um, you, you know, you've given me some very shocking information about just how the drugs flow across the border. I want to go back and talk about sort of the history of fentanyl, because that's yeah. the biggie right now. Yeah. Talk about where fentanyl's coming from, historically where it started, and when you first were made aware of it. Yeah, so I would say it first uh, started becoming a problem around 2013, 2014. Don't forget, Steve, that the height of the prescription uh, opiate epidemic in this country was 2012. 255 million opiate prescriptions. The adult population of the United States was 234 million. So was, does that mean everybody was on an opiate? No, that means a lot of people were on a lot of opiates. So as, that, as those prescriptions were dialed back and we had more, uh, more effective prescribing, et cetera, Prescriptions went down, but we saw people step in and start making fake prescription drugs. And that's where we first saw fentanyl. Now at that time, it was coming direct from China. So people would order it on the dark web. They would get small packages uh, by let's say DHL or some other international courier. They would press pills themselves and put them out on the market as if they were legitimate prescription drugs. And this is, as I said, 2012 through maybe 2015, 16. At that time, that's when I saw the Mexican drug cartels really uh, take an interest in creating fake prescription drugs. And what they did is they said, wow, Big Pharma has done all the marketing for us. We know now what uh, the Americans want, what they're looking for. We can create these pills. We don't have to do medical testing. We don't have to have pristine, clean labs. We can make them in our current uh, drug creation facilities, so to speak. And they started kind of flooding the U.S. with fentanyl. Uh, especially pressed pills that look like prescription drugs. And that's where the danger is, especially to our kids. Right, because you're talking, you're talking Percocet, Vicodin, oh, yeah. Adderall, Xanax. Xanax. These are things that are common for young people to experiment with or to take without much thought. Just, it's so highly potent that I don't know if people realize when you talk about it, 50% more potent than heroin. 50 times. 50 more. times yeah. more potent than heroin. So people are exposed to this stuff without even knowing at times they're exposed to this stuff. Such a great point, because a lot of times people will ask me like, hey, what has caused this huge incremental increase in harm in our community? One of the key words is deception. We haven't really had that. If you look back 30 years ago, we didn't really have a, a drug dealer saying he's selling you one thing when he's selling you something very different. Deception is a huge part of the marketing today where people in this country uh, have a feeling that 
uh, prescription drugs are, are safe or, or, you know, hey, this Percocet, it can't be that dangerous. I mean, I got it when I had a tooth pulled or something to that effect. The reality is, is the deception piece. There is no pharmaceutical ingredients in these drugs, none at all. The active ingredient is fentanyl, and there's, of course, other binders and fillers. They put stamps on them, coloring, size, weight. Everything else is identical to the prescription drug, and that is that word deception, and that's where the harm's coming from. People don't know uh, that they're getting, that they're ingesting fentanyl. And why? I mean, I, you know, why infuse fentanyl? I mean, what, what's the takeaway? I mean, knowing that it's a deadly drug yeah. and the cartels, aren't they taking big risks in killing people? It's about profitability, Steve. That's what it is. I mean, it's a drug they can create incredibly cheaply. Don't forget, uh, opiate drugs are highly addictive. They know this. So what is the alternative for them? Produce heroin, right? That's a plant-based drug. So in order, to, in order to scale production and put more heroin on our streets, what do they have to do? They have to control more land. It has to be land in Mexico where uh, the poppy plants can grow, a certain climate, very specific climate. They need, they need armed gunmen to protect those lands. They need people working in the fields, uh, scoring the poppies, scraping the gum. All these things are labor intensive. Or you can have a fentanyl lab in a garage move it like that to a different state in the country, um, pack it in a truck and drive it somewhere else and open it up again, and, and you're limited not by mother nature, but you're limited only by the amount of chemicals you can get from China. So it's a, for them, it's a no-brainer. It's synthetic drugs are the future, and uh, it's a supply-determined market. That's what I tell people. The harm that we're going to experience in this country is a result of the drugs that the drug cartels choose to sell over here, and they're going to sell. So they, make some, they the get most to money. set the tone and pace. A hundred percent. Then fentanyl itself, uh, I know it's used in medicinal purposes, and, and it's a, it's a uh, heavily used in surgeries and things yeah. of that nature. But uh, when people get access to fentanyl, uh, they don't know they're taking it. How can one even begin to uh, distinguish what the difference, or can they? No, they, you mean, no, they can't. I mean, that, that's the danger of it. That's the danger of it. They, they think, uh, like Xanax is a benzodiazepine. So, you know, does it have the same general effect as fentanyl? You know, arguably it does. It's a sedative, it suppresses the central nervous system, but it's a very different drug. And the drug cartel doesn't care. They're not looking to provide medical relief. They're not looking to relieve the symptoms that you're having. They're looking to trick you and to get you to buy a pill that you're then going to be addicted to and want to buy again. Well, that is assuming you've survived because if now you. there's so many tragic stories about so many young people taking it and immediately that's it. One pill can kill. That is the yeah. line we use because truly that's all it takes is just one pill. There's also a lot of misinformation, I think, um, or maybe even disinformation about how fentanyl works. So if someone, let's say, is poisoned by fentanyl, right? right? We, right. we say poisoning rather than overdosing. Correct, correct. And someone else comes near them, what is the likeliness of them also being poisoned by fentanyl just by being in near proximity? Yeah, it's, it's unlikely. It's unlikely in that scenario that you described, but I have seen situations where, uh, I have seen situations, there was an incident in St. Louis a couple of years ago where multiple people in one apartment building died. Uh, a dealer was selling crack cocaine that had fentanyl mixed with it, so people were smoking it. And when first responders came, I don't know if they did mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation or uh, there was still that residue in the air or whatever, but a couple of them were actually overcome. So it, it's, you know, hey, we, we, we try to dispel myths, of course, but we never want to give people uh, an incorrect feeling of, of, you know, complete safety in those situations. Now, if someone took a pill or snorted fentanyl, uh, are you safe being around them and rendering aid to them? Absolutely, 100%, and you have to do it. But there have been strange situations where, where first responders have been harmed. I was watching this interview with this mother who lost her son, and he'd taken a fentanyl pill. Mm -hmm. And she describes a scenario when they found him and first responders arrived. She wasn't even allowed to, like, hug him or touch him. And so that's why I was asking right. that question. That's probably more of a law enforcement protocol thing. Okay. They don't know. They have uh, a death. They don't know the exact circumstances yet. Their main goal is preserve evidence and preserve a potential crime scene. But you're not going to get poisoned by just no. someone else who passed away from fentanyl? No. Okay. 
Bill, what is the primary concern now for law enforcement? I mean, when you used to run the DEA here in LA, you know, you're telling us about all these things that you know exist, but what kind of a dent is the DEA and other law enforcement agencies making? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think, listen, the goal of law enforcement is uh, supply reduction. Supply reduction is harm reduction. Um, that's really irrefutable. The data shows that. The CDC maintains data on prescriptions, uh, prescriptions issued by doctors and then harm caused by those drugs. And we can see that as a drug is available more, the harm goes up more. So we know that by reducing the supply, as law enforcement does, we're reducing the harm, and that's a positive. Uh, the negative is it's just we've never before had uh, powerful drugs like fentanyl this available this accessible, and I draw a little bit of a distinction between those two words, and we've also never had the deception piece that we already spoke about. The accessibility right now is the thing that scares me, and that's where today's conversation obviously is really important with the social media piece. We were joined by Bill Bodner, who is retired a special agent in charge of the DEA, and now joining us again is a special agent in charge of Homeland Security Investigations, Agent Eddie Wong. Uh, agent Wong, we were talking with uh, Mr. Bodner before the break about uh, the impact that law enforcement is having on the influx of drugs from Mexico and cartels. Um, as, a, as an agent in charge of the Homeland Security's investigative branch, what are you seeing on the border? And, and how is it coming in? Is it coming in on the land borders? Is it coming from sea, from air? How is it coming in? So Los Angeles is unique. Uh, I call it the epicenter of transnational crime. Because when you look at it, there is no other jurisdiction uh, that sees the volume and intensity of transnational criminal activity, in, in this case, narcotics trafficking, than Los Angeles, because you have uh, the largest combined seaport uh, down in Long Beach, Lo uh, Los Angeles. Uh, you have one of the busiest international airports in the United States, which includes air cargo coming in and out. And we're three hours north of the Western Hemisphere's busiest land border crossing. So what we see is drug trafficking, uh, whether it's the finished product uh, or the precursors to the, uh, the ingredients needed to produce the finished product coming in in droves from all those environments, from the seaborne environment, air environment, and the land environment. Not only are we seeing the narcotics, the precursors, we're also seeing the, uh, the narcotic manufacturing equipment, pill presses, pill dyes, all that stuff that's needed to produce the counterfeit oxycodone uh, blue M30 pills that are being sold on the streets right now, that's all coming into the United States. Uh, and I would say the leading culprit in that is China. Um, are you making a dent? I mean, I, you, 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 this is a lot of stuff you just unloaded on us, but I mean, are your agencies, are locals, is law enforcement making a dent? Yeah. I, Without a doubt, law enforcement is making a dent. I, I think I would, you know, how you qualify and how, you know, quantify that uh, is different, right? Because I would look at what is the cost of not doing this? Okay. Think about it in that way. We don't have the ability to talk in the negative, right? If we did not do this, what happens? So we can certainly talk about the number of drugs that, you know, the amount of drugs that we seize, uh, we can certainly talk about the offenders that we have locked up, but some would say the narcotics are still pouring in. Flip side of that is what's the cost of not doing it? You talk to parents who have lost children from, especially uh, recently during these fent fentanyl poisonings, you talk to those parents, how many more parents would there be out there without their children if law enforcement didn't do what they did day and night? Um, social media obviously plays a big role with all of this because we talked about accessibility and how this is a big issue. Someone like a plug who's a dealer online easily is able to sell this stuff. Uh, you know, young people, just like they send emojis, they're easily able to purchase some of this. Um, the rainbow fentanyl pills are actually a big concern when I think about this because when you have younger kids, it looks like candy. It really does. And I cannot believe it, but I've actually already had a conversation with my second grader about rainbow colored fentanyl pills and tried to explain to her in terms she would understand like this is so dangerous and this could kill you. And the thought of having this conversation 
made me very sad. But I think these are conversations we have to have and we can't be uncomfortable having because this is happening out there. No, absolutely. What you've seen, what social media has done is it's gentrified the drug trade, the drug trafficking trade. Like you no longer have to go into this dangerous neighborhood, wherever that may be, to have, you know, to, to go out and purchase uh, narcotics for, uh, for consumption. Now it's as simple as getting online, looking up something, and then they'll deliver it to your home or to a location nearby. Like you don't have to put yourself at risk uh, to, to obtain these narcotics anymore. Bill, um, in your time with the DEA, were there any hot spots in LA County or in Southern California that was known for uh, making these pills? I mean, were there pockets? And you know, I know the cartel was controlling a lot of this, but I mean, were members of the cartel in Southern California taking those and building upon that, or were they selling to other gangs? I mean, what was sort of the process? Yeah, I, I would say not really any hot spots. I mean, they, so the pills would come across the border, or the fentanyl would come across the border, and contrary to what many people might believe or think makes common sense, it doesn't stop in San Diego, right? It crosses the border, it comes straight to LA, and this is where it's warehoused. As uh, Special Agent Charge Wong said, it's because uh, of all the airports we have, the trucking, the train stations. Um, this is a uh, transportation center for the rest of the United States. So drugs come into here first, then they're distributed all around the country. So we're always gonna have uh, unfortunately, a lot more fentanyl here in the L.A. area than many other cities. L.A. and Phoenix right now are the two top cities in the United States for fentanyl. And guess what? The two top counties in the United States for incidents of teenage fentanyl death are what? Maricopa County, number one, Los Angeles County, number two. And that's just because of the sheer quantity of drugs there. So, uh, you know... There aren't really any hot spots other than to say, like, L.A. nationally is a hot spot. I, I was just thinking, what? so what can we do about this, right? It's one, you know, you're trying to prevent this from spreading. Yeah. You do your best. The drugs are pouring in. You educate younger people That's and the so parents. Important, right. Um, you also have to have resources out there like Narcan, which mm -hmm. is a life-saving agent. Yeah. And this is something the LAUSD has taken very seriously. Yeah. And now they've trained their staff and they have have Narcan at every location. Is this something that you at home should also have just yeah. in case something like this happens? I think so. I mean, I carry Narcan. I, I checked my pocket to make sure I had it with me before I said that. But I have it with me right now. Um, I'm not a drug user. I don't know any drug users personally, but imagine finding yourself in that situation where you, st the, so the, the, the protocol now is when first responders find somebody down, it's the assumption that it's almost a fentanyl overdose now. Like the first thing that's done is administer Narcan. There's no ill effects if that's not what they're suffering from. That's done first just to say, okay, we're here. This person should be breathing. They're not. Let's administer Narcan. You don't want to be the person who's not prepared for that, especially if it's a situation with a loved one, someone you know, et cetera. So I think Narcan should be everywhere. Um, there are some concerns I have just about... Uh, people's kind of thoughts as to it being a miracle drug or something like that. Like in California right now, when Narcan is administered, the number of doses that are administered on average is greater than one, meaning more often two, three, four doses are used. Not many people carry that. I carry one single dose. So be aware that especially with the super powerful uh, synthetic opiates like fentanyl and the pills getting stronger and stronger as they are right now, it sometimes takes more than one Narcan dose to revive someone yeah. and also know that depending on where this person is in the drug, the drug use, uh, I Process. don't know, spectrum, yeah. you know, if they're an experimental drug users, you save their life, they will be happy with you. If there's someone suffering from opiate use disorder, they're going to be revived and they're going to be extremely uh, angry with you because their high just went away like that. They're now sober and they're gonna be uh, very mad at you, they could be combative, and they generally will refuse any further treatment. And what happens to those people then is they use again immediately, they still have naloxone in their system, it has, more, it has no effect. They use again, and they start to feel the high, but then as the naloxone wears off, the multiple uh, ingestions of fentanyl that they've now taken, they relapse into another uh, poisoning scenario. So there, there's some, when we administer Narcan, we have to get that person to a hospital. Just keep that in mind. It's not like, hey, we revive you. You're good to go. Walk away. No, we really need to get that 
uh, person treated by a medical professional. But to answer your question succinctly, Narcan should be everywhere. And you have it on you? I have sir? it on me, yeah, yeah. You show it? So yeah. It's, it, just for those who don't know, it's a, you spray yeah. it up your nose. It's, it's, it's a, a nasal spray. I'll take it out of the package. This is one dose, and you just put it in the nose. It's like a little nasal spray, and and hopefully that's that's all you need to do. Yeah, we carry it in the news truck. Yeah, and it should be available now over the counter at any uh, pharmacy. You don't need a prescription. No. You don't need a you know doctor's order or anything like that. And it's and it's you don't need a lot of. It's, there's not a lot of instruction to it either. It's pretty simple. The way I put it is, if you have a first aid kit in your car, you or you have, have the, there you exactly. go. Just make it part of your first aid kit. Wherever you have a first aid kit, put naloxone. Yeah, I was told minimum two doses. I, I think yeah. minimum two doses. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got, I learned that from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Welcome back to the KFI News Special, Sex, Drugs, and Social Media. I'm Steve Gregory, along with Aroxy Carpathian from Fox 11. And we have with us Special Agent in Charge of Homeland Security Investigations, Eddie Wong. And joining us also Sergeant from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department's Fraud and Cyber Crimes Bureau, Pete Hish. Uh, gentlemen, thanks again for being here. Uh, we're talking about, we're really focused on drugs. And Agent Wong, before the break, we were really kind of talking about the, the process in which these people go through in in manufacturing these drugs. And you say that the chemicals are coming over from China. And uh, where do they usually go? Are they coming right into the ports of LA and Long Beach? Or are they going into Mexico and then coming up? How does it work? There, there, there's a variety of routes. Uh, I would say that uh, the transnational criminal organizations have co-opted some of the United States legitimate trade systems. Uh, but there's also direct routes from China uh, and other places uh, in the Far East directly to the cartels. And, and as a Homeland Security Investigations, are you monitoring any of these cargo ships that have these particular chemicals? Are you keeping an eye on them? Absolutely. That's one of our top priorities here, especially you know, given the size of the, the ports and how busy they are, uh, not just at the seaport, but at the airport. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, with the volume of stuff coming in, uh, it makes it difficult to facilitate legitimate trade while still trying to do our, uh, our law enforcement uh, work at those ports. When you look at, uh, if you've ever been to the Port of Long Beach or Port of Los Angeles, and you go and look at one of those ships, it is absolutely uh, amazing at how large those ships are. And each one of those things, each one of those containers can contain uh, lethal amounts of uh, not only narcotics, uh, but the precursor chemicals to produce those lethal narcotics. When you're uncovering this, how often is it concealed? Or is it just out in the open? I would say, uh, it, it, so when you talk about the precursor chemical stuff, uh, it comes across uh, as, uh, it depends because those are, those can be dual use chemicals. So there could be an A, a legitimate use to it, and then B, uh, there could be a nefarious uh, use to it. I think some of the, 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 the ones that we concentrate on are the ones that are obviously illicit uh, in the importation when you look at uh, they were secreted, mismanifested. So if they said they were, uh, let's say, toys, and you come across, you know, you know uh, 40 gallons of precursor chemicals, then those are... Uh, that's obviously uh -huh. illicit, and then those are the ones that we want to concentrate on. What's the or, uh, point of origin, uh, origination, and then what's the ultimate destination, and who's facilitating those movements? Uh, Sergeant Hish, in Los Angeles County, uh, your jurisdiction, I know you work a lot with HSI and other federal agencies. Um, how many times do you think your cyber and fraud unit or bureau is involved in these operations I know you do a lot with other types of cyber crimes, but how about drugs? How many cases do you think you're doing where drugs are related? My particular team, it's rare. Um, we have had drug trafficking cases in the past. Matter of fact, one of them that comes to mind was a, uh, a fentanyl case where we were tipped off by, actually, we were given the, the uh, case from HSI to, uh, to pick up and investigate, and we did that. And it, it turned out to be a, uh, a person up in the, the Antelope Valley that was buying fentanyl, raw fentanyl in its raw form, having it shipped to a P.O. box up in the Antelope Valley. And then he was taking that and um, diluting it into um, nasal spray and then reselling them out on the dark web. 
So, and we were able to identify that person. Um, and between us and, and HSI, we, we arrested him and uh, got him convicted federally. And he did a significant amount of time in prison on the federal side. Are you finding that uh, a lot of these drugs move cyber through cyber? And then we were talking about apps and young people and the access they have. Are you seeing a lot of that action? Yeah. Um, the communications between the drug dealers and the, uh, the recipients, the buyers, is, I would say, predominantly through social media and online. It, it, it's no longer the, the, where you're finding a drug dealer on the street corner and you're going up to him and, and passing him money and getting the drugs. It's, 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 uh, you, you, find the, you find the dealers online and then you might meet them somewhere to do the exchange, but the money is often exchanged electronically as well in cryptocurrency or uh, other apps like Cash App and things like that, uh, it, it's done. But, but social media is, and Snapchat in particular, is like the hotspot for uh, illicit narcotics activity. We talked about Narcan and how important it is that p basically everyone carries one with them because you just never know who's going to need your help or mm -hmm. you know what's going to happen. Um, if you could touch on test strips, because that's been a bit of a controversial thing too, because many people say, you know, use these test strips to see if um, a pill has levels of fentanyl in it. Some people say that encourages young people perhaps to then be testing pills, which encourages drug use, or you can look at it as in they're going to experiment They'd rather see that this drug I was about to take could kill me and stay away from it. Right. Your thoughts on that? I would say, I would leave it at this, and it's pretty simple. That pill sitting in front of me may or may not kill me if I take it. Do I trust that test strip to tell me if there is a lethal amount of fentanyl in that pill? I'll leave it at that. Because myself, if I had a choice, okay, there's a 50% chance it's going to kill me, 50% chance it's not going to kill me. But this strip made by somebody that I don't even know is going to test it and tell me, oh, no, it's safe. Okay, am I going to take that pill or not still? I would say test strips are a false sense of security when it comes to um, ensuring that something is or is not going to kill you. Before we let these guys go, I want to open it up to some questions in the audience. Yes, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your service again. I'm David from East Los Angeles. My question is, do we know... How many people are dying each day or each year? From uh, fentanyl poisonings? Yes. So I think what you've seen is, is that the, the increase, don't quote me on the years, but it, it's, it has been steadily increasing year over year. And I think the last year that statistics were available is either 2022 or 2023, uh, where there's well over 100,000 uh, is individuals in the United States have died of uh, fentanyl or synthetic opioid poisonings. My last question, if a president of the United States wanted to, could they shut this down easy enough? Well, I, I think that's probably a question for uh, the president of the United States or, or someone, <laughs> in, so, someone in that branch. I, we, we in law enforcement, we execute uh, the laws on the books. Are so, you getting more, are you talking more about shutting the border down yeah, or, sh or stopping cargo or? Precursors from coming in. Got it. So the chemicals from like cargo. Uh, so what I would say is there are uh, ongoing conversations uh, regarding how we can best address uh, the uh, issue of precursor chemicals uh, at the highest levels of the U.S. government. Thank you for the question. We got another question here up here in the front. Hi, gentlemen. My name is Emily. I'm from La Habra. Um, I have a question regarding social media and the usage um, of fentanyl or synthetic drugs uh, through teens with these quizzes, these online quizzes to self-diagnose yourself if you're depressed or ADHD or whatever. Have we noticed a rise in the usage there? I really can't correlate the rise in narcotics use in general to these quizzes. But what I can say about these quizzes and these things that, that pop up on your social media feeds that want you to interact is that uh, they're, they're, they're not good. They're generally made to, remember, social media uses very powerful and sophisticated algorithms to position that user in a position to where it, it, it takes them in a certain direction, right? So these quizzes are noted by that algorithm and will 
change the content and feed them different things based on their uh, input into these things. And we don't know, you know, you, you get a, you get a self-diagnosis quiz. Is there a scientist or a doctor behind that doing it? Who, or is it just somebody who made it up or what, you know? But a team can get medication through that app, through that quiz. They can order medication. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would, I don't know the, the actual rules. That, that might be a, a question for the DEA on, on if it's legal to order certain scheduled drugs online. But if I, I were to say that you would normally need a, a doctor's uh, prescription to, to get these drugs, and then you get the drugs from a legitimate pharmacy, right? So that, that way you know they're safe. Uh, on these uh, apps, you don't know who you're getting them from. Who are these people? Okay, you're depressed, it says, and you could use Xanax. Click this link and we'll sell you Xanax. To me, that sounds nefarious, and that's something that I would never do or allow my children to do. Uh, if I think my child's depressed, if they're indicating to me they're depressed, I would take them to a professional, to a doctor, to be examined and given the, the proper uh, prescription through a pharmacy. That, that, that's how I would do it. Nothing, nothing on social media is real, I guess I could say. That, <laughs> nothing. Trust me when I tell you, it's, it's all craziness. Thank you for your question. Gentlemen, that's all the time we have for this segment. I really thank appreciate you. it. It's uh, great intel, great information, and thank you so much for being here. Joining us now are two gentlemen that um, have great stories to tell us, uh, but they are very tragic stories. I want to welcome Matt Capilouto and Sam Chapman. Please welcome these two gentlemen. <laughs> Matt, I want to start with you. Um, I've, I've attended press conferences with you in the past, and I've, I've heard your story, but I want you to tell everyone why you're sitting here today. Well, uh, as you mentioned, we, we had a, have a tragic story in our family. Um, I have four daughters, uh, Alex, my, uh, one of my middle daughters. She was uh, attending college. Um, she was on home for Christmas break. And two days before Christmas in 2019, she, uh, unbeknownst to, to us obviously, she reached out to a drug dealer on the social media platform, Snapchat. She was seeking Percocet and uh, what the investigation eventually uncovered was that this drug dealer, again unbeknownst to us at the time, but delivered to our house counterfeit Percocet pills, pills that he marketed as oxycodone, of which she took half of one of these pills before going to bed, and my, my wife found her deceased the next morning. Um, no parent condones their child purchasing drugs illegally. But I want to give some backstory. My daughter, from a young age, was uh, diagnosed with uh, what's called massive depressive disorder. She suffered heavily from depression and anxiety. Um, with that, eventually came self-medicating. Uh, she had taken some prescription drugs in her teenage years, which didn't make her feel well. Um, you know, her parents, myself and my wife, we weren't big fans of her taking medications that alter, you know, brain chemistry. Um, so we thought it was a good thing that, uh, that she stopped taking those. Um, and then she made her way into college. My daughter was a very bright young lady. Her IQ was off the charts. She was an honor student, had gotten into college on a full academic scholarship. And uh, for the most part, in her late teens, uh, and, and she passed when she was 20, we, we kind of thought she had a grip on this depression. So this really, blindsided us when, when we found out that she was self-medicating and reaching out to drug dealers in, in search of, of Percocet. Um, but where my advocacy comes in really is that her case was originally marked non-criminal and just an accidental overdose. And I was really, uh, I, I couldn't believe at the time um, that we were not going to go after the person who provided these drugs, and they were going to be left to, to continue this illegal activity. And uh, I, I quickly learned that California does not have good laws for holding, uh, I don't even call them drug dealers, I refer to them simply as death dealers. We don't have a single law in California 
that specifically holds these dealers accountable for causing death. And it was, it was soon after this that we came up with a very rational uh, piece of legislation to help address this issue of which we've been now fighting for nearly five years to get passed in California. I cannot believe it's taken this long for our legislature to address this issue. To this day, we have done nothing to hold these death dealers accountable. And equally as much as I blame the dealers, I have to put this on the back of our state legislature who refuses to pass any laws that will hold these dealers accountable. We came up with something very sensible known as Alexandra's Law. It's going before our state legislature for the fourth or fifth time here in a couple months. Let me mention, explain why it's very difficult to hold a drug dealer accountable for a death in California. We are left, our prosecutors are left with this burden of having to prove what is known as implied malice. They have to prove that the drug dealer knew the dangers of what they were selling and that they could result in the death of someone. That is very hard to prove. It's like a mindset. You have to prove what they know in their head, but how do you actually prove that? So what we did, we, we, uh, we decided to mimic how we handle driving under the influence. It's very similar law to what holds people accountable for vehicular homicide when they're arrested uh, uh, for killing somebody after uh, driving intoxicated. If a drug dealer is uh, prosecuted, um, uh, upon being found guilty, they are gonna be given an admonishment that makes them aware of the dangers of the drugs they're furnishing, and it lets them know that if they continue to furnish drugs and somebody dies as a result, they can be held accountable for murder. This admonishment would be documented in court records, and now these dealers would not have a defense to say, which, because right now they have a defense to say that, I didn't know these drugs could kill somebody. So it eliminates that defense, but more importantly, what I believe it will do is it will deter drug dealers from becoming death dealers. Ultimately, that's what I want. By the time this admonishment is being used to hold somebody accountable, unfortunately, a death has occurred. I want to prevent that death in the first place. I believe Alexandra's Law will do that. And if this admonishment does have to be used against somebody, well, we do have to have a mechanism to get them off the streets before they kill somebody else, because right now we don't. Uh, joining us now is Sam Chapman, a very similar story, um, and also uh, individually doing advocacy. And then we'll talk a little bit about how the two of you are working together. So Sam, why are you here today? So uh, we lost our son, Sammy, to fentanyl poisoning via Snapchat three years ago, Super Bowl Sunday, during lockdown. We thought our kids were safe at home in their rooms, and we had nothing to worry about except being isolated. But it turns out that isolation for teens is, in some cases, a death sentence because um, they were all online and they went to school together, but during breaks they got in trouble together. And a dealer reached out to our son on Snapchat and offered him something off a colorful drug menu. At the bottom it said, we deliver. And a lethal dose of fentanyl was delivered to our home like a pizza after hours. Our son didn't even have to leave our front yard to get what killed him. Um, How old was your son? 16, forever 16, and um, found him dead on the floor. Uh, my youngest son found him and screamed out. My wife and I ran, tried to resuscitate him and failed. Um, the PTSD from something like that is, it took two years to chase that out of my head. I couldn't even get in the shower without, you know, in the shower where you don't think about things, where the gray comes to you. It used to be my most productive time to think, and it just got filled with images of death. Um, but time does heal all wounds, and, uh, you know, uh, we call ourselves accidental advo advocates um, because we want to do something to make these young lives have meaning. They were lost so young, the idea that... Um, he didn't get to accomplish what he could have accomplished is 
heartbreaking for me. So I try and do it in his name. Talk about um, from that, Sam, uh, how did you and Matt get together? What brought you two together? I mean, the, the, clearly the tragedy brought you two together, but talk about that first time you two met. Well, so um, Matt and I uh, met in cyberspace. Uh, I had thousands of parents reach out to me. My wife is an Oprah person and the world knew what had happened to us. And so we created a Facebook page to get some of this energy, so uh, give it a place. There's 13,500 uh, members of Parents for Safer Children on Facebook who had this happen to them. And so Matt and his other activists reached out to me because they wanted to post on, on our site. And so that's how we first met. And then in person, we met um, marching outside of Snapchat uh, with pictures of our angels uh, trying to bring attention to the fact that children were dying on the platform. So we all formed up around Snap Inc. headquarters and marched around in a circle and then uh, bloviated in front of their headquarters until security came out and tried to chase us away. And uh, it turns out um, Bill Bodner, who was here before, says that, that that march is what brought this to their attention, that they didn't take this problem seriously at Snap Inc. until we started marching and uh, until Sammy died. Matt and Sam, first of all, um, my deepest condolences to your family. I know that years have gone by, but losing a child, that is something that never will go away. And you live with that every single moment, I'm sure. And my heart breaks for your family. But at the same time, thank you for the work you're doing. I know that you're doing this because you want their life to have purpose and meaning and for their, their name to be said, right? Because it makes you feel like they're still with you and you're doing work in their honor and paying tribute to them and leaving a legacy behind. For parents out there who are hearing this story and it's breaking their hearts, what would your message be? You each describe your children dying in your homes, in your home where they're supposed to be safe, right? It's the last thing on your mind that this would happen inside of your own home where they're supposed to be away from all the evils of the world. Right. What can you do as a parent? You had no idea this was going to happen. Well, th there's only one thing to do, and that's get Narcan in your house. Because right now, the, the laws have not changed. The social media companies are not willing to move off their profit motive. Um, the prosecutors are not prosecuting the crimes. Um, and so all we have are the remedies. So if everyone who has a teen put some naloxone in their home, then we'll be able to revive these kids when it happens. At the time Sammy died, though, did you have any idea that he had died from fentanyl poisoning? No, but there's, it's non-toxic. There's no harm. If you see someone passed out and you have Narcan, you give it to them. There's no harm. So you can't hurt someone with it, and so you might as well try. And this is the leading cause of death for adults 18 to 45. It's, it's more important than a defibrillator these days. You know, so that's really the only the only safe thing. Um, what I tell parents is get the username and passwords for your kids' devices as a quid pro quo for giving them the devices. And then at least on all the other platforms, you can go check. On Snapchat, you can't because the snaps disappear. And Matt, I, I want to ask, um, aren't counties, I know on a, on a federal level and a state level, there people are dragging their feet in terms of legislation and cracking down on this. But aren't counties, I know Riverside County is cracking down, um, San Bernardino County, aren't they going after uh, the dealers or the, the, as you called them, the, uh, the death dealers? Yeah, um, but in counties such as Riverside. In Orange County too, I know, I know Todd Spitzer is big on this too. Yes, um, I, I will say, and to toot the horn of, of Riverside County, we are leading the way in our state, perhaps in the nation. Um, but I wanna point out, until we fix our laws, these cases are gonna be the exception and not the rule. These are very challenging cases to work within our laws. I explained the, the implied malice. And, and I wanna mention that 
It all first starts with law enforcement being willing to do an investigation. Again, I'm fortunate that Riverside County has really taken the lead on this. And both our sheriff and our district attorney have been very upfront that every fentanyl death will be investigated as a potential homicide. Sam and I, uh, we, we, we're friends with many parents all across our state where law enforcement shows up and there's no investigation whatsoever. So it starts with law enforcement recognizing that there's a victim and there's a crime here. And they have to be willing to do that investigation. But I also want to point out this, and I'm going to touch on the Narcan. I support Narcan 110%. It has been shown to save lives. But a very large amount of the parents that I have met, we all found, their, we all found our kids, they died alone. Even if we had Narcan in the house, we went in her bedroom. We didn't hear her. We wanted us no, to. No, nobody point. was there. So, so we're not going to Narcan our way out of this. And not that this statistic is not shared enough. Less than two percent of all drug deaths result in the conviction of a drug dealer. Okay. The drug dealer, by the way, in my daughter's case, uh, he was eventually arrested on federal charges, not state charges. And uh, today he's in federal prison. But most, uh, it's, not, it's not the feds that are going to show up on these scenes. It's your local police and sheriff's departments. And number one, they need to investigate, right? They need to treat this as a homicide right from the get-go, sealing off the scene going after forensics, digital forensics, cameras, because a lot of evidence can be lost right away if that's not done. So we need to change law enforcement's uh, approach uh, when they show up at, at these cases. Some counties where they are willing to investigate, it, they've been, it's been shown that we can hold these dealers accountable. We still need, need better laws uh, to work within, because uh, these are very challenging cases right now, and the reality is uh, many of these prosecutions, well, uh, these prosecutions are really going to be the exception and not the rule. You know, just because you hear about one or two here and there, you know, there's thousands of deaths that are taking place every year, and we only get a handful of prosecutions. But something that I think is important to point out, especially with this being an election year, um, you know, hearing the great work that Homeland Security is doing uh, uh, with, with China and the cartels south of our border, I've been in this fight for nearly five years. And at first, uh, you know, I wanted to blame everybody under the sun, which included China for manufacturing the precursors, Mexico for the cartels for flooding this across our border. But my thinking as of today, and the president of China, the president of Mexico, have both come out and said, this is an American problem. And I have to tell you, I somewhat agree with them. And I want to back this up by saying this. I already mentioned less than 2% of all drug deaths result in the conviction of a drug dealer. That is a direct result of our bad laws here. I also want to point out that there is no evidence thus far of any high-ranking state official within the Chinese Communist Party, no evidence of any um, direct effort on behalf of their government to poison America. What you have is bad actors in their country, criminals, committing crimes in the name of greed, because that's what fentanyl is about, it's about making money. Same with the cartels south of our border. It's my belief at this point in time, we are not going to be able to stop China. We're not going to be able to stop the cartels. We've never been able to stop drugs from coming across our border. Now we expect to stop a drug that kills in the size of, of milligrams, you know, uh, that can fit on the tip of a pen, and we're going to stop this from coming into our country? No. It starts at home. And if we can't hold the drug dealers accountable here in our own country, we've got a problem. Sam, I want you to talk about, uh, we were hearing about Alexandra's Law. Talk about Sammy's Law. So Sammy's Law in California is Senate Bill 1444, 
and it would require third-party safety software for any platform that has children on it. And that includes gaming platforms like Discord. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but our greatest intelligence leak lately came on Discord and right. all of these platforms that have ways that um, players and individuals can communicate with each other are dangerous. Um, the platforms with our children do not allow for our third-party safety software. So TikTok, Snapchat, Discord, and the instant messaging platforms of Meta. So um, the reason is because Wall Street rewards them every quarter with the number of users that they announce, right? We need a law that gives parents visibility back into what's happening online, especially on Snapchat where the snaps disappear. And this third-party safety software alerts parents when something dangerous is happening on their children's devices. It also alerts law enforcement when something dangerous for society happens. These um, programs have stopped 14 school shootings, uh, have called the police over a thousand times to prevent imminent harm, and given out millions of warnings on parents' um, cell phones when something dangerous has happened on the platforms that do allow for this integration. All that's required is that a social media platform open up what's called an API or a link to allow third-party safety software integration. Before we run out of time, I do want to let the audience ask some questions because I know there's been some interest here. So um, Jacob is coming up here now. David from East Los Angeles. Gentlemen, my condolences and great respect for you. You're experts compared to where I'm coming from. I've never dealt with this. But in a word, what is the problem with our elected officials? Why do they not uh, serve us and take care of this? Money is the word. The, um, Washington is a wash in social media money. Um, there's an organization called Net Choice that lobbies and um, takes the positions that are hard for social media to admit uh, that they take and spreads money around um, to basically uh, buy legislators. Uh, I can tell you that the leader of the Senate's two daughters both work for social media companies right now, and that may have something to do with why the Kids Online Safety Act isn't coming to the floor. It may not. But it's a funny coincidence. Hi, David from Irvine here. <laughs> My daughter Marley here is a Gen Z, maybe the only one in the room. But I often have to ask her questions because I don't understand so much about their vernacular and their generation. What's being done to like actually reach out to the kids and like try to find out what's the need for all these pills? How do we deal with the depression? You know, like we're trying to bust the bad guys, which I'm all for, but why don't we start trying to heal the need for these things? But, you know, a absolutely, we need education in the schools, starting at a very young age, obviously age appropriate, but we need to start educating our kids as early as elementary school, middle school, high school. But I think it's important to understand there's not too many of us in this room that can say either we ourselves or a sibling or friends didn't dabble in drugs at some point, most likely in their youth. Kids today are making the same exact choices. Nothing's different. The only thing that is different is now they're dying. And, you know, if Sam's son and my daughter had made the same exact choice 10 years ago, they would be alive today. They would have taken something. There's no doubt they would have taken whatever drugs were, were out there, but it wouldn't have been fentanyl. Kids today are making the same exact choices that many of our friends did, or siblings, or, or certainly somebody we knew. We also have a generation in crisis. Uh, these kids have been shut in for COVID and it has uh, messed them up. There's no better way of saying it. And it's anxiety, it's depression, it's a lack of uh, proper education, not being able to keep up with other kids their age because their teachers didn't do a good job or they didn't go to a school where they did a good job. Um, you know, the average kid is now over a year behind mm. and still is in the grade that they were supposed to be in. So they're drowning. 
Our kids are drowning right now, and we've never dealt with anything like this before. We don't know how to deal with a generation that got shut in for two years. You know, it's incredibly damaging. No friends for teenagers to have no friends. Well, and having a digital friend. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because here's the thing: is I'm listening to you, Matt, when you're talking about you know kids are doing the same things. They are absolutely, but it's exacerbated and it's sped up because of digital technology. So they get access to gratification faster. You know, if you think about all the, the things we tried when we were kids, you know, it, it was a little more difficult to do the things that kids are doing today, but technology absolutely. makes it the, faster. The easy access to this to this drug is is it's crazy. I, I mean, and to deliver it to your home like a pizza, yeah. like you said, Sam. And it's not just the drugs. I have a friend whose kid was bullied over two hundred times, told to kill himself on Snapchat, and he did. Well, you know, you were talking about money uh, being the sort of the motivator as to why lawmakers, and that seems to always be the case, and they're always being funded by somebody. Um, but what I'm really curious about is why the social media companies. They're just now starting. I mean, you saw that display of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, and what were your thoughts on that? Did he seem genuine? Well, I was there, so he okay. was literally looking at me and apologizing. And he, I hope he doesn't apologize to his wife like that, because he sure didn't take ownership of it. He said that he was sorry for what we had gone through. And then went on to brag about he was an industry leader in trying to stop these things. So it was really braggadocious and uh, just an ineffective apology. Um, what I really loved about that was as we were sitting there and these people were filing and we all held the pictures up of our children. I saw that, And yeah. the CEOs had to walk in with 75 pictures of kids who had died on their platforms, staring them in the face. And they, no one said a word. It was like a funeral in there. And then at the end, one of the reporters chased him out like a criminal. And he dove into his SUV and she's screaming, what about the children, Mike? I mean, Mark, what about the children? Don't you have some responsibility for all the deaths? So he came in like a funeral and he went out like a criminal. And I just love that he had a bad day. That's, that's all we could do. <laughs> As Canada. we're talking, I just want to point out that this impacts every socioeconomic individual. It doesn't matter who you are, this impacts you. And sometimes I think we're in the mindset of, you know, it's not my problem until it becomes my problem, which is the wrong approach to have because it is in your backyard. Everything is happening to you in some way or shape, right? It will impact you eventually. So to take it seriously and... Um, and you mentioned bullying, it made me think of this, how things are the same and yet so different. Back when you were younger, you went to school and maybe got bullied on the playground. Bullying didn't follow you home on a 24 hour basis on social media. And so when you're dealing with things like this, you can see how children really need their parents there to you know, vent with, to guide them, to be there for them because they're dealing with way more than we ever have dealt with. Yes, they've got the choking challenge, oh. sextortion, send me a picture of your feet. There are all these crazy things that are happening to our children, and uh, they're fooling adults. Adults are falling for some of yeah. these scams. What do we think is going to happen with our children? You know? We have time for one more question. Hi, Emily from La Habra. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm so very sorry for your loss, for both of you. Um, we have a 16-year-old son, so that really hit home. Um, what are, besides the obvious, the key words, fentanyl and drugs and get high and all this, what are some of the words or the verbiage that the kids are looking up that we can be aware of or we can monitor? They're talking, using, searching. Right. So plug means plug me in mm -hmm. and a plug emoji. If you type a plug emoji into Snapchat, you get drug dealers reaching out within seconds. Um, a, a snowflake is cocaine. A tree is marijuana. And the beauty of Sammy's Law is that this third-party safety software companies use artificial intelligence to keep up on drug emojis and slang so that they let the parent know what the danger is. Is that where we can find these resources or a list of 
Right. For instance, um, Bark.us is one of the software companies. She's our could, guest next. You you can look yeah. them up. You, she's, Titania. Yeah, Titania's on next. She's she's yeah. a, a gem. Good. So you save that question too for her as well. And with that, gentlemen, we're going to say thank you so much for your time thank you. and th thank you for telling us your stories. I know every time you have to tell this, it's it's got to take a piece of your heart out. But uh, at the same time you're letting a lot of people know uh, about how to prevent it from happening to them. So it, It's a good way for us to, to channel our energy because we could very easily go down a, a, a deep yeah. rabbit yeah. hole. So I appreciate you guys listening. And, um, and I, I think, you know, I can't say I speak for Sam, but I think I speak for Sam as well when, when we say, hey, our, our kids are in a great place right now. And uh, it does us... Um, it, it, it really helps us out therapy-wise when, when we can tell our stories and not just have people listen, but take action. Look at who you're electing in the upcoming election. Uh, we have some <laughs> very odd people in our state legislature who keep squashing Alexandra's law. I'm going to name them real fast. Senator Stephen Bradford, Senator Nancy Skinner, Senator Scott Weiner, and Senators Aisha Wahab. If you happen to be in their districts, vote them out of office. Welcome back to the KFI News Special, Sex, Drugs, and Social Media. I'm Steve Gregory, along with Alexi Karpatian from Fox 11. Joining us now is the Chief Parent Officer for Bark.us. It's a great new platform that is really taking hold with parents because of what it can do to help parents. You just heard Sam Chapman in the last segment talk about Bark.us being an architect of Sammy's Law. So we're going to let Titania Jordan tell us all about it. Titania, first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Talk about Bark.us and, and who came up with it. Sure. So Bark.us was founded by Brian Basin. He's a dad of two, uh, was actually working at Twitter at the time, and his oldest son was given a device that he realized, oh my gosh, my son can now access the entire world, the entire world can access him, and the existing parental controls on the market aren't good enough. So Brian took a big risk, left Twitter, started Bark, added me to the team. We're now a team of 140, and we help to protect close to 7 million children across the nation. Wow, that's incredible. And and how do you exactly do that? Yes, thank you for asking. So we launched with an app that used AI to analyze children's text, email, browsing history, social media, etc. So we're analyzing the context and the content. And when we detect an issue, whether it's drug dealers, suicidal ideation, predators, bullying, um, you name it, we then send parents an alert via text and email, letting them know here's what happened, here's where it happened, and then here's what you need to know and how you can address it with your child. So we started with an app, and then we launched in-home hardware that can help with the smart TVs and gaming consoles in the home that couldn't connect at the account or cloud level. And then we most recently launched a safer smartphone for children because so many kids were being given iPhones and, and other phones that were just wide open and children need to be able to navigate tech safely and under appropriate parental guidance. So that's that's our suite of products and services that help to keep kids safer online. To Tanya, uh, one of the things that the common th thread that we've, we've heard now in the last uh, hour or so is that kids are pretty smart and they can figure things out and they know the workarounds. Is, is your software or your platform, is it one of those that is sort of surreptitiously installed on the devices? Are the kids aware that it's on there or how does that work? Great question, nuanced answer. Um, because we have a variety of products and offerings, there are some elements that can be added to children's devices or accounts without the child's knowledge. That said, we don't recommend that. Um, open, honest conversation about why you're using this software is highly recommended, much like you don't keep it a secret when you put your kid in a car and make them wear a seatbelt, right? It's not a secret when you put sunscreen on them. It shouldn't be a secret why you're looking to keep their tech as safe as possible. So we don't recommend you doing it behind their back. Also, because eventually you're going to get a bark alert and you're going to want to talk to them about it. 
and they're going to want to know how did you get that bark alert what is bark so try to be up, up front with it um, also with the workarounds um, that was one of the most important things about us launching our own smartphone is because the bark operating system can't be removed from it can't be circumvented other parental controls like Apple Screen Time or Google Family Link, there are workarounds um, that children can circumvent the protections meant to keep them safe. So just to be clear, if your child is going elsewhere to use social media, this would still detect their activity? Or if they're using someone else's computer, someone else's, obviously someone else who doesn't have this set up, they're able to kind of go around this, right? So that's a great question. Um, if you have your child's, let's say, Instagram account connected to Bark, and they go to a friend's house and they log in to that Instagram account, Bark is analyzing that account at the account level. Now, if they go and create a new Instagram account, Bark will not already be connected to that, but Bark will know that they have done that and send you an alert saying, hey, it looks like your child has created a second Instagram account. You should talk to them about getting it connected to Bark. Wow, that, that's, that's great. pretty interesting. Um, so if you're, you're suggesting that parents be transparent about it and say, listen, I have this on your phone, um, is it something that the kids can remove from the phone? Can they, can they go through, I mean, some kids have coding technology or coding abilities and I mean, is it fail safe or, or foolproof? Nothing is 100% foolproof when it comes to uh, apps that you add to an iPhone. Um, Apple makes it very difficult to keep kids safe on their platforms. Apple prioritizes privacy, which is great for adults, not great for raising a child. So uh, can some savvy children work around Bark app on an iPhone? Yes, it is very difficult. And we do alert you when it has been disconnected. So you'll know so that you can go back to them and say, hey, we've, we've got to keep this connected. With an Android or the Bark phone, it can't be disconnected. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we say if you're going to give your child a smartphone or a tablet, go with an Android-based model or the Bark phone. How many people are using this feature right now? Do you have data on that? I, I do have data, you know, uh, like I um, mentioned in the beginning, our footprint is about 7 million children across the United States. We do have users in Australia, South Africa, and Guam as well. And it's uh, not only children using it, or it's not only families using it for their children, you know, with home and personal issue devices and accounts, but we also have a footprint across over 3,500 school districts in the nation because schools give kids tech, right? Access to Google Docs and the Microsoft suite of applications. And um, it's pretty terrifying to note that about 40% of schools nationwide aren't using adequate filters or monitoring tech. Only about 60% of schools across the nation are actually doing something when it comes to keeping their kids safer on school issue tech. So Bark has a footprint across personal tech and school issue tech. Talking with Bark.us, when we come back, we'll uh, also take questions uh, for Titania, and we'll talk more about this fascinating software. But first, this is the KFI News Special, Sex, Drugs, and Social Media on KFI AM640. Time now for a news update. Okay, questions for Titania? Anybody? Okay, you got one, two. Okay, you got two questions. Okay, good. And where's Jacob? I can't see. Oh, there's Jacob. Okay. So we got two. We'll do that. We'll come back. Um, let's see here. Okay. We ready? Okay. Here we go. Moving on. Hour number two, segment eight. Hour number two, segment eight in three, two, one. Welcome back to the KFI News Special, Sex, Drugs, and Social Media. Along with the Roxy Carpathian from Fox 11, I'm Steve Gregory. And thank you for joining us. We've been speaking with Titania Jordan. She is the chief parent officer of Bark.us, a fascinating software that also our previous guest, Sam Chapman, was telling us about. Uh, Titania, can you tell us a little bit how you got involved with Sammy's Law? Absolutely. You know, we heard the heartbreaking story uh, about Sammy. And if Sammy's parents 
could have been using Bark, if Snapchat would have allowed Bark to have been connected to Sammy's accounts, we could have alerted them to this this drug deal, the menu of options, so many things, and we would still be here. And that story is replicated across so many children, across so many platforms, across so many instances. And we have given social media platforms enough time to make their platforms safer for children. And despite what they have rolled out, it's not the case. And what we haven't done is fully empowered parents to keep their kids safe online. If a parent wants to be able to protect their kid online, they should have the right to do so. We should be able to let parents protect. There is software out there, and the only blocker is some of these platforms saying, no, we don't want to integrate with, with this platform, despite a parent wanting to do that. So it's time, it's time to change that. It's time to change the laws. It's time to give parents the ability to keep their kids safe online, just like we do in real life. Yeah, you have to work together for the common goal. Which social media platforms uh, have you had the most trouble with and which have been easier to work with? Yeah, um, so Meta has been uh, better to work with. Um, they, from the beginning, have been uh, pretty accommodating, whereas Snapchat, absolutely not. They, I would say they get an F <laughs> as a grade when it comes to working to keep uh, kids safer online on their platform or working with third party platforms. Why, why is that? I mean, what, what is the upside for them to not participate? I mean, why, why, why do you think they would put themselves in that position? They'd lose their audience base. I mean, their audience base is children. Um, the whole premise of their app was for sending disappearing nudes. Now, why anybody lets their child get onto an app that was launched under the premise of sending disappearing nudes is another story. And full disclosure, I fell into that same bucket of parents that let their kids have Snapchat because every kid had it and that's how they wanted to communicate with their friends. But it's not okay. And Snapchat is currently deemed as one of the coolest platforms for kids. Um, you know, even their parental controls that they've rolled out don't do anything. You know, what we are not talking about, and I'm glad we're talking about tonight, uh, there's so many dangers of Snapchat, including Snap Maps, that lets anyone that your child is connected to see their real-time live location. And you as the parent can't turn it off. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not okay with the fact that my 15-year-old son can share his location with anybody on that app. It's wild. Let's take some questions here before we run out of time. I know there were a couple from the audience. Uh, Jacob Scott right there. Hello. Hi, uh, Yvonne from Simi Valley. I work in middle school. I'm curious when you had mentioned that a lot of school districts, yeah, I mean, all the children in the school district that I work in, they all have their Chrome, the Google Chrome, the book, the Chromebooks, I guess. How is, do you have any information on, uh, how do I phrase it? What kind of information these, are? is it uh, nefarious information these kids are looking on their Chromebooks? Because they each have one. What do you have information on like what kind of stuff they're actually looking up? Because I'm just curious for school districts that are not quite on it as they should be. If that makes sense. Oh yes. I mean it's it's tech that's connected to the World Wide Web, which is the Wild Wild West, which means they can access anything if, if filters and settings aren't appropriately in place. Children are able to access pornography, um, they're able to write suicide notes in Google Docs. They're able to create digital burn books uh, to bully other kids. They're able to access social media, YouTube, Reddit, the dark web. I mean, it's a tool that can access the internet. It's, it's a very powerful tool that can be deadly in some cases, as we've heard. Another question? Yeah. I just have a question regarding um, the verbiage or the emojis that our children are using that are for drugs or sexual content, whatever, where can we find that aside from the obvious ones? So if you go to bark.us slash blog, or just go to bark.us and look at our resources, we have so many guides, drug guides, uh, sex slang guides, emoji guides, gaming guides. I mean, the ways that children speak about things, not even using words, is simultaneously very clever and also very eye-opening. So we have all of that at bark.us. Hi, James uh, Lapointe. 
Um, so for obviously, it's, it is disappointing for you know social media platforms like Snapchat not allowing that integration with your software. Uh, my question is: Is there still a way that your that your software can still uh, use any data that maybe Snapchat isn't providing up front, but um, can use data that can help prevent you know uh, cyberbullying online and you know, um, any drug transactions or anything of that nature? Yes, and I'm so glad you asked that. Um, two main ways. So one, um, even though both Apple and Snapchat continue to be blockers for uh, online safety solutions, um, with the Bark app and iPhones, because we are able to capture data saved to the camera roll, a lot of children will take screenshots of some of the most provocative and problematic conversations happening on Snapchat. And that's how we've been able to get alerts about some of the problems like bullying, et cetera, that have been happening on Snapchat. Um, not only that, but we were able to escalate a, a credible school shooting threat because of a screenshot that somebody took of a threat written on the bathroom wall of a school. Um, so we're still able to monitor Snapchat, although they make it very difficult for us with iPhones. With the Bark phone, we're able to fully monitor Snapchat. Um, not only uh, Snapchat chats, but the My AI function that they rolled out without any parental permission that can lead children astray. So the, the Bark phone and the Bark app for Android phones can monitor Snapchat um, more completely, uh, despite Snapchat's unwillingness to work with us. Titania, I can't thank you enough for your time this evening. Uh, you've been a trooper. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for all the great information. Also, I want to mention that you authored, co-authored the book, uh, Parenting in a Tech World. Um, and so a valuable resource, and it's bark.us. So um, I, again, I, th I think it was great. Sam Chapman mentioned you and how you're working together uh, with that legislation, and uh, we're all going to keep a very close eye on it. But Titania, I wish you a wonderful evening and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.